Good evening and welcome. Um, buenas noches y bienvenidos. Este mensaje será repetido en español enseguida. I would like to provide a brief overview of tonight's meeting after a few procedural items. The board will hear 30 minutes of public comment. At the end of the meeting, there will be a second and final opportunity for public comments. So if you do not get a chance to speak during the first call, we encourage you to stay to the end. To request to participate in public comment, please raise your hand now by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of your screen and selecting the raise your hand uh, button. To comment by phone, you will be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you want to raise your hand, if you wait to raise your hand, I'm sorry, until the public comment period starts, you will not get to speak and you will have to wait until the end. When called upon, you will be promoted to a panelist, which means that you will appear on screen. So if you do not wish to appear on camera, please be sure to disable your camera on your end. The board president will call on our students first. So if you are a student who wishes to speak tonight, please right student at the end of your name. And the board president will also determine whether to set tonight's speaking time at one, two or three minutes per speaker and on an individual basis also has the discretion to allow for extra time for those who need translation or have other speech needs. When your time has elapsed, you will see Vice President Brown's screen. There will be a timer um, behind her in her background and you will know when you have 15 seconds left. If you are still speaking, you are allowed to finish your sentence. Please try not to speak beyond your time. Thank you. Voy a proporcionarles un breve resumen detallando el orden de esta reunión. Después de unos procedimientos preliminares, un periodo de media hora será dedicado a comentarios públicos. Al final de la junta, habrá una segunda y última oportunidad para quienes no pudieron participar durante la primera llamada. En ese entonces, pueden quedarse hasta el final de la, de la junta para participar en la segunda llamada. Para comentar por videoconferencia, haga clic en el botón participantes en la parte de abajo de su pantalla y seleccione el botón levantar la mano. Para hablar por teléfono, le levante la mano presionando estrella 9. Al ser llamado o llamada, le van a permitir hablar uno, dos o tres minutos dependiendo de la dirección del presidente. Usualmente el presidente llamará a los estudiantes primero. Si hay estudiantes que desean hablar esta noche, a favor de indicar que son estudiantes al escribir estudiante después de su nombre. Eh, el presidente también tiene la discreción de otorgar tiempo adicional a quienes requieren traducción o cualquier otra adaptación especial. Al ser llamado o llamada, será promocionado a panelista y aparecerá en pantalla. Si no desea aparecer en pantalla, en pantalla a favor de apagar su cámara. Cuando haya transcurrido su tiempo, verá el reloj detrás de la vicepresidenta Khadija Brown y sabrá cuando le faltan 15 segundos. Si todavía sigue hablando, a favor de terminar su oración, pero trate de no sobrepasarse de su tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chávez. Um, welcome everybody to the June 2nd a meeting of the Berkeley um, School Board. We um, opened our meeting uh, at 5.30 today, recess to closed session, and um, calling the public session to order at seven o'clock. Um, can you, um, if you, if you'd like to um, raise your hand for public comment, now is the time to do so. Once we start, as Ms. Chair said, once we start public comment, um, we'll cap it at whoever has raised their hands at the time that we start. So now would be the time to raise your hand. Um, Ms. Chairs, can you call the roll? Director Babbitt um, is not yet here, but I know, I know she'll be here. Um, can you call the roll? Student Director Miles Miller. Present. Director Ana Vasudev. Presente. Director Laura Babbitt will be joining us shortly. Uh, Director Julie Sinai. Here. <clears throat> Vice President Khadija Brown. Present. President Hyalpa. Uh, present. Um, okay. Um, now we will approve the agenda. Um, is there anybody, anybody, any changes anybody wants to make to the agenda? 
Consent oh, item, sorry. Consent item 11.20 needs to be pulled. Um, the approval of the budget for temporary construction? Yes, okay. Um, Director Babbitt, um, uh, did, you, uh, did you want to change anything in the, in the agenda? No, I'll be fine. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will pull item 1120 altogether um, off the consent calendar. Otherwise, we'll leave it as is. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? I mean, sorry, motion to approve the agenda? I'll move the agenda with the necessary adjustments. Thank you. Fair second. Okay. Second by Director Vasudev. Shires, can you call the roll, please? Director Miller? Yes. Director Babbitt? Yes. Director Vasudev? Yes. Director Sinai? Yes. Vice President Brown? Yes. And President Alvin? Yes. All right. Thank you all. Um, now I will turn it over to Vice President Brown for a report out from closed session. Again, please raise your hand now if you wish to speak in public comment. Go ahead, Vice President Brown. Thank you. Okay. Um, closed session June 2nd began at 5.33 p.m. Um, for item 3.1.1, um, it was moved by President Alper, seconded by Director Brown. Uh, motion passed five to zero. For item 3.1.2, it was moved by Director Sinai, Seconded by Vice President Brown, motion passed five to zero. For item 3.1.3, .3, it was moved by President Alper, seconded by Director Vasudev, motion passed five to zero. For item 3.2.1, the board heard an update and provided direction. And for item 3.2.3, for item 3.3, .3, the board heard an update and provided direction. This is the report from closed session. Thank you, Vice President Brown. Um, all right, um, now we're gonna move to public comment. Um, everybody will have two minutes to, tonight, Vice President Brown, um, and Vice President Brown will have the timer. Um, the la I know you all in the audience can't see the participant list, but the last person um, to speak will be Hillary Hardcastle. Um, the first person will be Liza Lutzker, followed by em Emiliana Bean. Um, and everybody will have two minutes each, please. When, when you see Vice President Brown, she'll give a 15 second warning. Um, and then uh, if you could wrap up your comments so that we have an opportunity to hear from, everybody who's raised their hand right now. If you raise your hand after, now, once we start, um, you'll be able to speak at the, close, at the um, public comment period after at the end of the meeting. All right, um, we'll start with Liza Lutzker. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good evening, board and superintendent. Um, I'm here to speak about the large class sizes in fourth grade that we will be experiencing next year at Sylvia Mendez, unless anything has changed. Um, I've written to you about this previously. Um, as I believe you all know that in 2016, voters approved BCEPT funds. This is a Berkeley citywide approved measure uh, by all Berkeley voters. And the major advertising point of this measure um, that people campaigned on was specifically intended to reduce the jump in class size while students moved from the third to fourth grade as had previously happened. Um, unfortunately, it seems that Sylvia Mendez, as well as possibly at some other schools in the district, because the district is choosing to use enrollment data from 2020, uh, 2021 uh, school year, um, the class sizes are being assessed based on uh, dropouts that were related to COVID enrollment. And Sylvia Mendez is facing class sizes for fourth grade as large as 28 students, which is far, far greater than the average class size of 23 students that the BSEP funding um, is intended to do. So the big issue here is that the state has chosen to ignore 2021 enrollment data uh, for their funding decisions for the 21-22 school year, but for some reason, Berkeley has decided not to follow suit and to use enrollment data based on dropout rates that were related only to COVID. Um, this is a huge issue, um, especially as our students come back from COVID. There's a huge amount of learning loss that our students are facing, 
a huge amount of trauma that our students are facing. And there are a lot of parents who have lost faith in the district and a move like this to increase class sizes, which goes directly against the voter approved, the Berkeley wide voter approved measure to reduce Thank class sizes me. in fourth grade is a big problem. Um, so we have some other parents here. We'd like you to use the COVID funds to fund Thank a you. third section of fourth grade. Okay, thank you. Um, Emiliana Bean, followed by Nova Bazej. And if, if, if everybody could um, try to limit their time to the two minutes, that would be great. Go ahead, Emiliana. Hello. Hi, my name is Emiliana, and um, I'm a mother of a third grader and also a kindergartner at Sylvia Mendez. Um, and I would like to add my voice to what Liza uh, just said. Um, you know, when I found out about this decision, I was just so disappointed um, that this Berkeley Unified would go back on their promise for an additional fourth grade. Um, you know, as educators yourselves, I don't have to convince you that a large class size um, is really detrimental to both the students and the teacher alike. Um, you know, especially after the learning loss that our children have experienced this year, it really goes against any promises that you have made to do what you can to give our children their best chance next year. Um, and I would just urge you to please don't base this decision on an average class size, but instead please consider the experienced class size of the students uh, who are affected by this decision. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Nova Blazage, followed by Beatrice Leva Cutler. Good evening, um, board. Um, as the school year comes to a close, there are a few things that I wanted to, to share with you regarding my thoughts. Um, I'm a parent of two Berkeley High school students. And um, obviously it's been a very challenging year. And one of the things I feel is very important is that there be an acknowledgement that everyone throughout the Berkeley community, all the students have all lost something, whether that loss is really, really tremendous or it's maybe something on the smaller end nonetheless, there, there's been a loss. And some of those losses are losses that we know and, and others are losses that we, we don't know. So for example, um, teachers and all of you may not know of the depression that's been experienced individually by teens. We also don't know about those students who maybe never made a real connection with their science or math teacher this year and may not go on to, to pursue a STEM career. So. I think it's really important um, as we try to come together as a community again, that the board really do acknowledge that there's been loss for, for everyone. The second thing I'd like to ask is that, um, that BUSD talk about how we can learn from other districts because other districts did open up for academic instruction for middle school and high school students and Berkeley did not. So what is the learning from that? And the last thing I'd like to say is um, really like to ask you to please bring parents back into the relationship, into the parent, student, teacher slash board relationship. Um, we are all so very invested in our community, in our students, and in their future. We have felt very, very locked out this past year. And so some of the ways you can do that is just to be very, very transparent in your decision making. That hasn't been the case this year. And to provide information early and often. Um, and also just to give us the bad news too. If things aren't great, or if you just don't know, that would be helpful to know. To kind of Thank try you. to say, well, we don't know, or it might be like this or like that is not helpful. So I know my time Thank is you. up. Thank you very much for your consideration this evening. Thank you. Um, next, we have our former colleague, Director Beatrice Labor cutler There you are. You're muted, Beatrice. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, honorable board members. You're, for you're, you're rusty. <laughs> for once again, making bold statements in a resolution to highlight the need and the value of addressing the opportunity gap, the importance of collecting educational data, 
access to resources and support to Latinx students and their families in BOSD. This resolution also lifts up that all families of color, Black, Asian, and under special needs are equally valued and important to BOSD. The resolution is a statement of commitment that BOSD makes to Latinx and to all of our students. My belief as an educator is that nobody's children are more important than another. When any student is left out of an opportunity to learn, we are all impacted. All students should have equal access to reach their full and excellent potential. Ex excellent potential. Your commitment as a board to the district, to the students and to their families to work together, to set a vision, work with a superintendent, the district staff and our communities to find solutions that serve all of our students, leaving no one behind. Education is not a one size fits all. And this resolution identifies the particulars that need to be addressed to better serve our Latinx community of students. Your lens, experience and voice for all our Ber Berkeley students, teachers and parents is just be stronger when we all work together to address equity. I want to thank you each for your service and for your collective action and to work to align funds behind this resolution for our black, brown and all our disenfranchised students and identify metrics to measure what is working, not working and what needs to be improved upon. Because when we work together to lift all students, we all stand to benefit. As one of the co-founders of United in Action, Latinos Unidos and your former school board member, I invite you to continue this focus that founders community members have advanced all along for justice, equity and education for all our children. Muchas gracias. It's nice to see you all. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Thank you for being here. It's Thank great you. to see you. Um, all right, next we have Gloria Munoz followed by Deborah Nelson. Uh, greeting board members and Dr. Stevens. My name is Gloria Munoz and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of BFT and BFT's uh, Teacher of Color Network. First of all, congratulations are in order to all of our graduating seniors, eighth graders and promoting fifth graders and kindergarten students and all of their loved ones. Felicidades, congratulations. Um, but I am here tonight in support of the Latinx resolution that is being put forth. We want to acknowledge the collective and collaborative efforts that went into the creation of this resolution. Multiple stakeholders worked in tandem with a shared goal to diligently work toward the closing of a long-standing opportunity gap that was further compounded by a pandemic. On behalf of BFT and the Teacher of Color Network, we are in full support of this resolution. And as it states that although the resolution is focused within the Latinx community, it also uplifts the unity and the values of Berkeley Unified to uphold in support of the achievement and success for all students of color and students from all backgrounds and abilities. We look forward to partnering with you in ways to bring this resolution and the others before it into fruition. As we look for ways to implement both systems of accountability and pedagogical practices that reflect and center the lived experiences of our students of color. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Um, Deborah Nelson, followed by Dan Leverton. Hi, this is Deborah's daughter. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you, go ahead. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would like to comment on the proposal to change the BHS bell schedule. I'm a BHS student. I'm class of 2023, and I do not think that switching to a block schedule will benefit the students. Um, first, according to the slide deck, the block schedule means that we will lose close to 22 hours of each class per year. This is a massive amount of instructional time that we will lose. Second, 100 minute periods are not conducive to learning. They are far too long. Students will be drained and lose focus. Finally, I have been hearing from my teachers that the block schedule will have negative implications for their ability to teach, especially in foreign language courses. I trust my teachers and I hope that you will too. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for being here. Um, Dan Leverton, followed by Yvette Falarka. Go ahead, Mr. Leverton. Dan Leverton. Thank you. I had to click a couple of buttons. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. 
Um, I'm a parent of two daughters at Berkeley High, one finishing 10th and one finishing 12th. It's been a difficult year um, for all the students. Uh, there's been a loss of learning. There's been a loss of social opportunity and growth and, <clears throat> and much, much more as, as we all know. My question tonight concerns the BUSD's policy with regards to requiring vaccinations to start the fall of 2021. I'm making some assumptions that our best chance to resume some sort of semi-normal school is one in which everybody that enters the school is 100% vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> I would think that, that would decrease some of the, the cost and protocols if we don't have to worry about the 13% of people that choose not to be vaccinated um, in this city based upon a Berkeley side article. So I'm, I'm curious what the position is, when you, how you are handling this and what sort of timeline we can expect uh, to hear about going forward so that we, we can help the community as possible get vaccinated in time to start school in class, which is pretty early August. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Yvette Falarka followed by Lucinda Bingham. Good evening, Yvette Falarka. I teach at Martin Luther King Middle School and I'm speaking on behalf of the Eon Bam Caucus. First, I wanna speak in solidarity with the parents who spoke out for Smalter's fourth grade class sizes at Sylvia Mendez and also at all the elementary schools and in support of the Latinx resolution. But I'm here to talk to you about what I've been speaking at at almost every school board meeting this for the past year, which is on the question of COVID and the pandemic and student and staff safety. I'm still gonna to continue to argue that our schools need to remain in distance learning until student vaccinations and ongoing COVID testing are mandatory for every student as well as every staff member. Mask wearing and social distancing need to continue to be required Minimally, a distance learning option should be available for each grade level and subject open to every BOSD family who makes that decision. But at the May 19 school, school board meeting, the superintendent stated that a chunk of elementary school families indicated a preference to keep their child in an online class at the start of the 2021-22 school year, but then stated that as of now, BOSD's only plans for elementary school families that choose to keep their children home is independent studies. This boils down to a shocking and cruel punishment of children as young as kindergarten from having the collective experience of daily online classes with other children. If BOSD needs to hire more teachers to fill the DL positions, then that's your responsibility to do so but not doing so discriminates towards students and families who have ongoing health conditions or for whatever reason, given that as of now, there is no requirement for all returning students to be vaccinated. Reopening schools with no safety measures when only part of the population is vaccinated turns every school into a Petri dish for the virus to mutate and becomes more resistant to vaccines and more contagious toward children. The school board should stop playing Russian roulette with our students' lives. Thank you, Ms. Falarka. Um, next, we have Lucinda Bingham, followed by Clue, C-L-O-O. Hi, my name is Lucinda Bingham, and I'm a parent of a third and first grader at Sylvia Mendez. Um, thank you to the board and to the staff for what you've done this year. Um, it's been tremendous. Um, I would like to speak to the um, fourth and fifth grade class size at Sylvia Mendez. Um, as a voter who supported the 2016 BSEP bond measure, uh, I feel cheated. Um, as a parent of a child with an IEP, I'm worried. My third grade son barely made it through the months of distance learning. Um, since April, he's been back at school and struggling with the expectations of a real classroom. Uh, remember that the I in IEP stands for individualized, and there's no way that a teacher, no matter how excellent, and every teacher and staff member at Sylvia Mendez is excellent, um, can individualize learning for a classroom of 28 students, um, especially students who have suffered through the chaotic and disjointed experience of pandemic learning and learning loss and everything that has happened this year. Every child will need individualized attention next year. 
Um, and I choose to send my child to Berkeley Public Schools because I'm proud of the inclusive, attentive uh, model that, the, that BUSD strives to achieve. The funds exist to maintain this model that voters approved and parents, children's, children and teachers have been planning for for many years. Please be prudent and don't defund a fourth grade teacher at Sylvia Mendez Elementary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Clue, C-L-O-O, -O, followed by Rochelle R. Clue. Hi, sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> uh, my name is Carol Liu. I am a mother of a 10th grader at Berkeley High, as well as a sixth grader at Willard. And what I'd like to talk about is that how well the uh, schedule for Berkeley High uh, worked for our child. Um, it was definitely much better for her overall mental health where she didn't have seven classes of coursework per day, uh, as well as homework related to those seven classes. So with this current way that the distance learning had it set up, she was able to um, have definitely have a um, better grasp of time and, and energy and brain uh, work to, um, to deal with the classes. Um, so, and then also it would uh, be just overall increase in, mental increase in mental health and less anxiety and stress for all, I believe all students at Berkeley High to have the, the schedule that they had just for distance learning. And thank you, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Ms. Liu. Um, next we have uh, Rochelle R, followed by Paz and Melendez Canales. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Good evening, board members. Um, Board members and teachers, thank you for all that you've done. My name is Rochelle Rohr, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my children um, who are attending Sylvia Mendez, third grader and a kinder. Um, we're coming off an incredibly difficult year uh, when we know there was significant learning and language loss at Sylvia Mendez. Last week, I learned that we're also not getting the additional fourth grade class that our school has planned on for years. So as of now, our fourth graders will have a larger class and one of the, ex uh, planned teachers for next year in fourth grade, one of the two will be new to the fourth grade team. And I feel like this is really just setting them up for failure. Um, I understand the justification um, using the uh, current data, but it just doesn't make sense. And as one other parent said, we want you to realize the actual experience of the kids in the classroom. Uh, the struggles that a larger class size would represent for my child are very real. Uh, my third grader has a 504 plan that was established just this year. She's currently being evaluated for an IEP. Her class um, at the end of this year is 16 students in the physical classroom, five in distance learning, and it will skyrocket to 28 next year as it currently stands if another fourth grade isn't added. This will make the, a larger class will make it very challenging if not impossible for the teacher to honor her 504 plan and the likely IEP that's developed. Her plan includes things like one-on-one -on -one check ins at the end of a lesson to check for understanding. Uh, re receiving nonverbal cues from the teachers, having a quiet space to work to avoid distractions and manage her anxiety. But mostly it requires <laughs> a teacher to have the capability to observe, pick up on things and respond accordingly. And an overcrowded classroom makes this much harder. Although our teachers are magical wonders, <laughs> I cannot imagine they could actually honor these recommendations that are needed for my child to learn, particularly in a year after a pandemic, when we know the learning and language loss has been enormous. Um, so I'm asking you, please help us not have to make the choice. Uh, we are thinking of removing our child from Berkeley Unified because of this. So please, I ask of you, fund a third, fourth grade class at Sylvia Mendez. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paz Melendez Canales, followed by Stephanie um, Kajina. And then we have Mark Joseph Ramia and Hillary Hardcastle will be our last speaker of this public comment period. Start. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Hello, my name is Paz Melendez Canales, and I have two kids 
uh, three kids, one at Longfellow and two at VHS. I'm here to support the Latinx res resolution and the um, ch new changes to the TWI model, which will allow for a heritage language speaker category for admissions into TWI. Because of the, the reduction of Spanish speaking ALs in the district, it's important that this model opens up the possibility for students whose parents, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, speak Spanish because it will allow for children with cultural ties to Spanish to be able to connect with their loved ones. I also su highly support the Latinx resolution because we urgently need the district to support the significant number of long-term English language learners that need to be reclassified and Latinx students in general. To help with this, I'm advocating for full-time ELD teachers at each school that has English learners so that they can coordinate and organize ELD, an ELD program that actually gets implemented so that EL students get their 30 minutes of ELD every day. Currently, there are schools that have two to three students reclassified every year. This is a disgrace. It is obvious that ELD is not being done or is not done in a way that they can progress every year or progress faster. So having one ELD teacher at each school will help with this. For example, with the help of a district, with the dis, a help of the district ELD coaches, that person can work to step and coordinate some type of program that works for all teachers and can perhaps also train staff. If you are not working 100%, it is very hard to assess students, coordinate the different groups at the different levels needed, train other staff, follow up on progress, and keep parents informed of the progress. As it is now, there is a significant gap between Latinx students, both EL and non-EL, and their non-Latinx white peers in terms of students who graduate with with their UC eligibility requirements for college. So we urgently need to support the college readiness, readiness of all that next students. The resolution also mentions parent engagement. There's a huge need in the Latino community for information in Spanish to the right channels, not email, for example. So they can stay up to date on what is happening in the district. And there's also a need for parenting classes, seminars, and how to navigate the education system. Because of the effects of parent engage, uh, therefore, uh, because of long-term impacts of the pandemic, engaging the next families will now be more important than ever. Therefore, I also support a position at OFI that can coordinate communications and education seminars. Thank and you, Ms. Uh, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Stephanie Kahina, followed by Mark Joseph Ramia, and then Hillary Hardcastle. Kahina. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Good evening, Board Directors and Superintendent Stevens. My name is Stephanie Kahina, and I am the Bay Area Vice Chair of the Chicano Latino Caucus of the California Democratic Party. I am here today to speak in support of Agenda Item 13.1, the resolution in support of the achievement and success of all Latinx students in BUSD. The current inequities and outcomes for Latinx youth in BUSD is appalling. And it is clear that you alone hold the key in addressing these severe gaps. Thank you for your bold leadership. We are happy to see that this resolution outlines tangible actions and metrics to help address the pressing needs of Latinx youth, especially English language learners. In passing this resolution, the USD will be setting a meaningful precedent for other school board districts to follow regionally and cementing its commitment to Latinx youth in achieving their potential. As Vice Chair of the Chicano Latino Caucus, I fully support the passing of this resolution and I'm grateful for the solidarity that BUSD's Board of Directors is showing to the Latinx community with their vote. Thank you, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Um, Mark Joseph Ramian, followed by our final speaker, Hillary Hardcastle. Mark Rami, Instructional Assistant, BHS. The district's Samantha Tobias Espinosa did not follow through on completing discussions with BCCE President Lynette Robinson about the financial effects on classified employees of the district's changing the schedule of the school year 2021. At the beginning of the school year, payments for employee medical expenses were taken out for August 2020 by the district's unilateral decision. Then the district made a unilateral decision not to take out funds during the month of September and then June of 2020, so September 2020 and then June of 2021. The classifieds now lack knowledge of when the district will be taking double payments in, in either August or September or some other month to make up for what was not taken in June. 
Second item, during these trying times, the district seems to be creating issues by now not having structures for absences on records in place and not willing to clarify and answer questions. I tried to find out the process for documenting during COVID. I set up a meeting with Elizabeth Betty Pizarro for which she agreed to show up for a meeting but heard nothing from her afterwards until months later. I was told that the procedure for listing absences had changed due to the COVID and would be done through my supervisor. This was confusing. This should have been a simple issue to deal with because it should have been built into our structure. So we may find that some people will be docked with or without conversation. And that wouldn't be right when the district didn't have a structure for dealing with absentees set in place to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, our final uh, public speaker will be Hillary Hardcastle. And then anybody else who raised their hands once we started will be able to speak in the public comment period at the end of the meeting. Go ahead. It's Hardcastle. Sorry, there we go. Uh, hi, my name is Hillary Hardcastle. I am the parent of a rising fourth grader at Sylvia Mendez. I want to join the other parents here in expressing my concern at the district's decision not to fund a third teacher for fourth grade at Sylvia Mendez next year. My son has a 504 plan and already struggles at school, both academically and socially. The pandemic has harmed him tremendously in terms of his social skills, academic abilities, and emotional well being. Huge class sizes next year will only exacerbate those harms. The timing of this decision coming off a year of social isolation and inadequate distance learning is terrible, especially for kids with learning difficulties. Our fourth graders are already behind where they should be academically. We are all aware of the correlation between class size and student achievement. That's why BSEP was passed. This plan, instead of helping our fourth graders regain some of the ground they lost this past year, will just set them further back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hardcastle. All right, that concludes the um, open public comment period. Now we'll move to union comment. Um, I, I don't see any union. I'll give our union leadership. There, I see Mr. Hernandez. So President Hernandez, um, from BCCE, um, you have, did we just, did you make him a, there he is. Um, President Hernandez, you have five minutes. Good evening. I think you're muted. There, can you hear me now? Yep, there you go. All right, good evening, uh, school board members and Superintendent Stevens. BCC is asking you to strongly consider the importance of the work our members have done throughout the pandemic, and especially this 2020-2021 school year. BCCE is asking that our members are given a stipend to give some additional compensation for extra work we have done in order to meet the educational, emotional, and safety needs of our students and additional training and requirements of all employees. The stipend BCC is asking for is to address the time beginning with our MOU for the school year 2020-2021 and the distance learning, which began November 1st, 2020, and continues through the end of the MOU for phase two, in-person learning and ending June 30th, 2021. We would like to remind you of some of the ways in which our members have adapted, acquired, and implemented new skills and proven to re to be resilient during these times of COVID-19. In distance learning before vaccinations were available and after vaccinations were available, when schools reopened and so many of us returned to work in person. During the 2021 school year, nearly half of, of our BCCE members worked in person, adapting to the changes brought on by COVID. Those members that came back in person when school reopened in March and April have had more public face time than any other BUSD staff. BCCE members stepped up to answer the call, which allowed BUSD to be one of the first districts to reopen in-person learning in the Bay Area. Many BCCE members' job duties were altered and our members had to learn new skill sets. 
and worked with different sets of tools. Some even stood in for teachers and students. BCCE members were involved in all year planning, preparation, implementation, and maintenance for the safer reopening of schools. The transportation department played a huge role in figuring out how to get our students to and from school, which also saved the district some money in not having the contract out. Bus drivers saved BUSD 500,000 that BUSD was willing to pay Michael's transportation services to bus our students. Bus drivers changed previous language in the MOU that allowed BUSD BUSD to double students' capacity on buses, even though this would have put them in a higher risk for COVID. Nutrition services have been working in person the entire time since the original school closure. These employees deserve our recognition. In closing, I ask that you take into account the district's mantra, we care, willingness, empathy, aptitude, responsiveness, effectiveness, all the ways that our members have embodied the work during the vital time. I appreciate your time consideration for these employees. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, President Hernandez. Um, appreciate it. I don't see any other union members, so we'll move to um, committees. We have a we have a, a few committee comments. I know we have um, DLAC, which is our District English Learner Advisory Committee. We have, I think, um, is Sandra Loving here from. Um, the Parent Advisory Committee, or PAC. Um, I see Weldon Bradstreet from the um, Planning and Oversight Committee. And then we have Carla Schneiderman from the Construction Bond Oversight Committee. So we have a number of committees represented here tonight, which is great. Um, why don't we, Liz, Ms. Chires, do you wanna, um, do you wanna play the video from the RDLAC representatives? Good evening, school board members, superintendent Stephen, and community. My name is Patricia Rodriguez. I am a parent of a child in seventh grade in Longfellow. And I am here as one of the co-chairs in DILAC. And I want to share some reflections from our site representatives. Before I begin, I feel it is important to state that above all, all else, we are parents of children who are multilingual learners, and we as an adults are also multilingual learners. More of us are immigrant parents, learning to navigate the U.S. schooling system through the experience of our ch children. I feel it is important to share this because it impacts the way that we are able to advocate, and it makes the difference when there's an intentional intentional space created to support us in becoming the strong advocates that our children need. DILAC has met several times since we last offered public comment. In two of these meetings, we have been in collaboration with Parent Adv Advisory Committee. We appreciate the opportunity to meet jointly with PAC. As we understand, both committees are discussing services that came out of LCAP supplemental funding. We would like to address and disrupt a narrative we keep hearing, which is that the funds the district is receiving are one-time funds, and that we should, should be cautious in spending these funds on staff. We disagree. We feel strongly that funding key positions that have direct contact with the multilingual learners and their families are key, especially when we recover from, from the learning loss during the pandemic. Good evening. I'm Sagrario Cepeda, the other Villa co chair, and also the parent of an eighth grader at Lotenchelo and a fourth grader at Tausanos. We would like to see the federal COVID funds be spent on the following. Fully funding English language development teachers at each site and include coaching and collaboration time with classroom teachers. Need, needs assessment of current services provided to English learners and the creation of an ELD program that is integrated and systemic across sites in TK through 12. Additional funding support to the revision of the EL master plan. 
summer programming for multilingual learners that includes a family engagement component, such as family literacy workshops. Found a full-time office specialist at each school site, from preschools to high schools, and include BTEC. Funding for a bilingual family engagement position dedicated to providing parent education opportunities district-wide in English and in Spanish. Regarding the LCAP funds, we want to see funds spent on supplementing services for EL students and not supplanting. This means that funding for ELD teachers needs to come out all out of the general fund as baseline and supplement with LCAP funds to offer a sustainable model and program that serves the needs of our students. Finally, we are, we are well aware that the needs to be cultural with shift when it comes to serving multilingual learners in the classroom. ELD teachers are there to provide designated ELD and to collaborate with the classroom teacher to meet the students' needs. This still means that the primary person responsible for ensuring the students' needs are being met academically is the classroom teacher. We look forward to continuing to strengthen our partnership with school and district staff to best serve our students. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, next, um, we'll go to um, Weldon Bradstreet, who I believe is here on behalf of um, the Planning and Oversight Committee. Is that right, Mr. Bradstreet? And Carla Schneiderman, if you could raise your hand um, so we can call on you for the, thank you. And I know, Ms. Loving, that um, you're on the list too for the PAC. Go ahead, Mr. Bradstreet. There, I finally, finally unmuted as well. Um, good evening. My name is Weldon Bradstreet, and I am a co chair of the Planning and Oversight Committee. The Planning and Oversight Committee is charged with oversight of BSEP and BARA, the two supplemental taxpayer measured passed by BUSD voters that total almost a quarter of the BUSD budget. This year, the PO decided to routinely come before the board and district leadership to keep you all apprised of our work and to highlight the various issues of public concern our members have been asking about as we review and approve budgets that total almost $32 million in Berkeley taxpayer provided funds. Since the district will soon have a new person directing the BSEP and BARA programs, we want to reiterate the major themes that consistently came up in our statements to the board and make clear what priorities the, the P&O will focus on next fall. The major themes we raised to the board and district leadership include the following. Theme one, firm priorities. The current BSEP measure, measure E1, lists priorities for how supplemental tax dollars are to be spent. The P&O needs to hear what the district's core priorities are and how their spending priorities comport with measure E1. Theme two, documentation of the efficacy of BSEP spending. A constant theme within the P&O is our request that the district show us the educational outcomes and impacts of their BSEP and BARA spending decisions. Essentially, we want the district to show its work. While we acknowledge that progress has been made in revising documents provided to the P&O about how this information will be presented, more information about actual outcomes and impacts is required. Theme three, promoting equity. Related to student the impact of the spending, uh, the PO has asked how equity is specifically addressed across our student community, our educational programs, and our full inclusion model. Not from the perspective of where dollars are spent to support equity, but rather to learn the overall equity impact of that spending. Theme four, fund stability for the full term of the measure. We know budget cuts are looming for the general fund in the 2022 and 2023 school year. We also know that current BSEP funding may not be sustainable for the full term of Measure E1. Over the past few years, the, the BSEP budget has taken on expenses that were previously part of the general fund, but BSEP funds may not be available to help in that way to lessen the impending cuts. Therefore, BSEP spending decisions will need to be made very carefully going forward to keep the fund stable. Theme five, preparation for the new, uh, for renewal of the measure. 
Preparation for the next BSEP measure needs to start soon. While BSEP has traditionally enjoyed strong voter support, we are uncertain if the Berkeley voters will support an additional increased tax in our current times. We believe that it is imperative that the major themes outlined and are addressed and publicized to maximize the prospect for the renewal of the BSEP measure. After working closely and successfully with our outgoing BSEP director, Natasha Beery, the p recommends the board of directors and superintendent to consider the following points in identifying her successor. Point one, revision of priorities. The current responsibilities of the director are too broad and under-resourced. There needs to be a streamlining of responsibilities, clear priorities, adherence to those priorities, and appropriate resources allocated. Point two, independence. The p and views the director position as a guardian of public funds, and as such, this person must have independence to appropriately represent taxpayers and be the bridge between the p and and the district. Point three, be in the room where it happens. With oversight of almost 25% of the district's budget, Ms. Beery's successor must have a seat at the table as a member of the superintendent's executive committee. Point four, holistic understanding of BUSD's budget. Ms. Beery's successor must be able to understand how all BUSD budgets and programs fit together and have the ability to communicate, effectively communicate that to the P&O. Point five, ability to prioritize BSEP and BARA dollars. Ms. Beery's successor must have the ability to guide the district and the P&O through, through what we know are going to be difficult budget decisions in the coming years. Uh, lastly, point six, this person who will replace Ms. Beery this person needs to lead and deliver the next BSEP measure. We'd like to thank the board of directors for the opportunity to come before you. And we're looking forward to working collaboratively with you to meet our expectations and requests for the next year. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much, Mr. Batchard. Thank you for your service on this committee and for those um, comments. We really appreciate them. Um, next, we'll hear from um, Ms. Cherries. It's Berkeley High School PTSA. It's Sandra Loving. Um, from the uh, Parent Advisory Committee. Hey, everybody. There you are. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay. In the last five board meetings, there has been an outpouring of parents and students advocating for the Bridge Program. The board has heard from current students and their families, alumni students and their families, and most significantly, incoming ninth grade students and their families, none of, none of whom will reap the benefits of the bridge program if its resources are not increased. Bridge demands far more of its coordinators and teachers time than they receive compensation for. To preserve the program we currently have, this needs to be acknowledged and addressed. Currently, 150 incoming ninth grade students qualify for the bridge program. Is this board satisfied to only make the bridge program available to 25 of them? In the wake of the looming lost learning that we know is out there, but is yet to be assessed, can we make this program available to at least one additional cohort? Shouldn't we embrace expanding it and leveraging what has worked so well? When our prioritized students get to Berkeley High, many of them are below standards in math and English language arts proficiency because the supports that LCAP, BSEP, and the general funds have provided over the years have not sufficiently met their needs. What happens to these students at Berkeley High? Is there any data that demonstrates how academic scaffolding Berkeley High has in place is serving them? What gives us the confidence in Bridge is that we know it works. There is data on every aspect of the program. We hear from students and families all the time that Bridge is working for them. Every PAC has supported Bridge because it is a direct services program. When a parent or guardian texts a Bridge teacher in the evening or on a weekend, that's a direct service. When a bridge teacher contacts a math teacher to clarify a homework assignment, that is a direct service. When a bridge teacher coaches a student to advocate for the opportunity to boost their grade, that is a direct service. When a bridge teacher helps a student gain the confidence to talk to their teacher about the challenges they are facing and to ask for understanding and additional time, that is a direct service. When a bridge teacher works on finding a counselor to help a student experiencing a mental health crisis, that is a direct service. Right now, we don't have confidence that the district will provide the academic and emotional supports that Berkeley High's prioritized students will need when the school reopens. Expanding bridge in the wake of the pandemic is a sensible as well as a strategic game plan that we fully support. 
We support adding an additional bridge cohort. We support adding integrated supports and additional direct services to include tutoring for any student with a D or F and opportunities for internships. We support adding home and school connections to include meetings with the family members of struggling students. We support adding instructional assistant staff members to increase communication and diversify the staff. We support providing Bridge with its own counselor to support and address significant traumas that Bridge students have suffered as a result of COVID. We support enhancing Bridge's capacity to do more program evaluation and fine tune its program effectiveness even more. Bridge is a program that's been proven to work. Thus far, eight cohorts of 25 prioritized students have successfully graduated and gone on to four-year colleges. The time has come to embrace Bridge's success and expand it to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks for your service on the, on the PAC. Um, all right, next we have, um, and I think, Ms. Chires, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think our last, um, committee speaker is Carla Schneiderman from the Construction Bond Oversight Committee. I think that's right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to represent our committee. Um, I, you know, what, one of the things we really wanted to communicate is how fortunate we are to have the staff support that we do as a district and as a committee. It meant that when we looked at the materials on the audit, both the performance and the financial audit, we found the absolutes, absolute information that we needed in order to say that everything is done better than expected for the committee. Um, and in this trying time, it's really been refreshing to work with people that continue to push forward with high standards and to uh, ensure that we all have the support we need in building and maintaining the physical plant that makes all the other programs possible. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them about the report, but thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schneiderman. Thanks for your service on that. Um, on that committee. We really appreciate it. And thanks for being here tonight um, and for the report, which is in the agenda. Um, okay, I'm gonna um, move us along to board, um, board member and superintendent comments. Um, tonight is a bittersweet um, night because we're saying goodbye to our student director, Miles Miller. Um, Director Miller, I don't know if you want to have the first or the last word or somewhere in the middle, but I'll, I'll let you um, let me know when you'd like to go. Yeah, I can go first. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, yeah, so like President Alper said, tonight is my last meeting. My term officially ends on the last day of school. So um, yeah, and that's tomorrow for Berkeley High Kids. So unfortunately, it's coming to an end. Um, this journey has been absolutely incredible. Um, a year ago, when I initially ran for this position, I did not think that this is where we were going to be at all, um, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, the skills I have learned and the experience I've had working next to these incredibly talented and smart individuals has really propelled me in just what I want to do in life, because this is what I want to do. I want to be a policymaker, and I want to change things in schools, and so it's just been incredible. So I want to thank all the current people sitting on the dais right now for putting these meetings together and making sure that this position is possible for me and future students. I also want to give a shout out to um, former directors, Judy Appel and Beatrice Lynn Cutler, um, who I don't know if they're still here, especially Judy Appel because um, she actually met with me when I was running for this position. Um, I didn't even think she would. I just emailed her like, I do want to meet. I want to talk about what this entails. And so just really want to give a special thank you to her. I also want to give a special thank you to um, Dr. Babb as well for helping me with all those public meetings we ran earlier um, as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just been awesome and I'll definitely be back. I still have a brother in this district, so I'll be back to advocate for certain things, but thank you so much, really, from the bottom of my heart. Oh, and I'm really excited for the discussion later on the block schedules and I'm really looking forward to getting to that. Great. Thank you, Director Miller. Um, who wants to go next? Everybody's smiling. Director Babbitt, do you want to go? 
Oh, I'm tearing up. I'm going to miss you so much, uh, Student Director Miles Miller. I've so enjoyed working with you on the school board, and I so appreciate your leadership, uh, which I've said many times before, but it truly is genuine, and I'm so looking forward to uh, seeing all the great things that you're going to do in life. Um, I know that you're going to go out there and make us proud and um, continue this work even further from the educational policy level. Um, and wherever life takes you, uh, you're going to be a valuable uh, member of society. And uh, we just look forward to seeing you in the paper, seeing those quotes come from <laughs> our former colleague. <laughs> um, I also want to congratulate all of our graduates um, who and promotees uh, throughout the district, um, rising stars. Thank you for continuing to reach for those stars. Thank you for all the hard work that you put in. Thank you for all that you've endured, especially over this last year, um, and still uh, set your sights towards accomplishing this goal of uh, promoting or graduating. So we are always here for you. We are looking forward to all of the wonderful things that you are all going to accomplish. And wherever you go, just know you can always come home to Berkeley. Thanks. Thank you, Director Babbitt. Director Vasudev, do you want to go? Sure. Um, well, I also want to echo Director Director Babbitt's sentiments and also what President Alper said. We're going to miss you, Director Miller. You were, I think you were the first person I met after I got elected and had a sit down with about what your experience was like. And so um, I, I'm going to just miss you a lot. And I think you exemplify the best from our BUSD students, right? Like we want our students to be future leaders, we want them to know that their opinion, you know, I want our students to graduate knowing that their voice matters. And I think, um, you know, if it's one thing that you take with you is that I hope you know the, the power of your voice and how important it is. And, you know, I love that you want to go into public service and use it for good because you have a lot to contribute to the world. And I'm so glad, I'm gonna start crying. I don't wanna start crying, but like, <laughs> I'm so glad that we got to overlap and, and work together. And um, you look like a mini version of President Alper. And so I am sometimes looking at you guys on the screen. <laughs> it was, I could see your future, Director Miller. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure working with you and thank you for everything. And I hope we continue collaborating even in your, in your last couple of weeks um, here before you go off to, to college and greater things. I also just want to thank everyone to came, who came out tonight to give public comments. I'm especially grateful to the advocates who came in support of the Latinx resolution and also to the Sylvia Mendez parents who came to advocate for smaller class sizes. I'm also grateful to our labor partners who spoke today, including our Teachers of Color Network and our classified union, BCCE, which echoed the important contributions of our education workers during the pandemic. I don't know if many of you know, but um, our classified staff have been working here for, during some of the most difficult times of this pandemic. So thank you for echoing um, your thoughts tonight. I'd also like to thank our DLAC committee for providing input about our budget it's so important that we continue to uplift the voice of our immigrant families as we're putting together our budget. And so I really appreciate your comments tonight, Patricia and Sagrario. Muchas gracias por venir hoy, por darnos su comentario sobre el presupuesto del distrito. Yo creo que es importante que nosotros sigamos apoyando a nuestras familias de aprendizaje en inglés. Y estoy eh, muy agradecida por los comentarios que hicieron esta noche. Today, there are many exciting things on the agenda. I'm thrilled to have worked with my colleague and board president, Ty Alper, to introduce a resolution to proclaim June lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride month, and ensure that we will display a rainbow flag at each school site and facility within the Berkeley Unified School District. And so to everyone watching, I want to wish you just a happy pride month. I'm also really excited to have worked with Vice President Khadija Brown to introduce a Latin X resolution tonight in support of the achievement and success of all Latinx students in Berkeley Unified School District. Latinx students represent over 22% of our district and tonight's resolution will help address some of the pressing needs for targeted strat strategies that will help close the opportunity gaps faced by Latinx students and Latinx English learners with regards to math proficiency, college and career readiness, and the need for improved reclassification rates for English language learners. I hope that someday we won't need these resolutions. And I hope that someday we'll close our opportunity gaps for our most vulnerable students, but we're not there yet. And so these resolutions are incredibly important. 
I'm also thankful for Dr. Thomas Reinhardt, the Teachers of Color Network, Latinos Unidos at Berkeley for their contributions as well, because we can't pass these kind of equity focused resolutions in a vacuum, right? And so I look forward to the discussion about the resolution tonight, and I'm grateful for all the partners that came together in unity to help draft it. Thank you again for everybody coming and watching the last couple of board meetings. Um, I really appreciate you. And I know that everyone's watching our LCAP discussion and our discussions related to the budget. I um, thank you for your comments. We're still formulating our budget. So please continue to advocate and send us your comments. They, they mean a lot to us and, and I review them very carefully. Thank you. Thanks so much, Director Vasudev. Um, Director Sinai. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to just elevate and extend my appreciation to student director Miles Miller for your um, amazing contributions that you've made to this board over the year. I think you have represented students, um, not just Berkeley High students, but students throughout our district in bringing their voice to the table, uh, making sure that they were at public comment and that they got elevated in public comment and taking the initiative of doing the town halls and the community meetings. I think that um, I'll, you know, I really value your insights, your questions, the comments that you make are extremely thoughtful, and I just really appreciate everything that you brought to the to the screen. I'm I'm disappointed that we have never actually sat in the same physical room together. So I'm looking forward to you returning from college uh, when we're all back out there in the world and seeing you and shaking your hand and congratulating you uh, directly. Um, and thank you for your service. And I too, you know, you ran a phenomenal meeting at the last board meeting and any uh, education organization, nonprofit, corporate entity, wherever you end up is going to benefit from, you know, the tremendous work that you put in, you know, in your education. So thank you. Um, I also want to elevate um, and acknowledge all of the graduating seniors from Berkeley High, Berkeley Tech Academy, and uh, Berkeley Independent Study and uh, Berkeley Adult School who um, are graduating a whole lot of folks as well. Um, it, you know, we've all talked about what a ho horrendous and amazing year this is and it's had, you know, unique joys that have brought to us that a lot of us never, you know, anticipated and a lot of uh, pain and heartache. And I just think everybody who is walking the stage virtually or in person um, over the next few days um, deserves a tremendous amount of appreciation and acknowledgement for the phenomenal effort that it took, um, not only to get through your years of education, but to get through this last year. Um, and um, I, as somebody said earlier on in public comment, all students have faced um, amazing hurdles and, um, and I just really wanna appreciate all the families that have supported those students all of the community members that have supported their students and all the teachers and staff who have supported our students as they've uh, carried on in their journey. I also wanna thank um, all of the parent committees that have worked in this last year. Um, it, 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 you know, it was a parent engagement in a way that we've never experienced before. In some ways it feels like it was more distant and in this virtual world. And in other ways it created opportunities for people to engage who have not been able to physically show up to meetings, who have not been able to physically be there all the time, but have been able to participate and have their voice heard. So I, I hope that we've learned in this year of how we can have a hybrid of parent engagement and family engagement in the coming year, um, years to where, uh, you know, all of those folks who've come out to public meetings and have come to the school board to give public testimony, if you can't show up at a meeting, figuring out ways where we can still hear your voice through virtual. And um, I'm hoping that our technology folks are gonna be working over the summer to figure out how when we as a board come back in person, um, we can still have opportunities for uh, the public to be engaged. And um, lastly, well, almost lastly, I wanna thank President Alper and Vice President Brown and Dr. Stevens for rearranging our calendar um, coming into the school year, it's on consent. Um, and making sure that the board meets before school starts uh, versus after school starts. And I want um, our community members to know, our family members, that we are in touch and will continue to be in touch with the superintendent throughout the summer. It doesn't mean that we aren't engaged, uh, but there will be a board meeting before the start of school 
Um, so thank you for taking that into consideration. And then just lastly, I'm looking forward to the discussion, so I'm not gonna talk about it a lot in relation to the LCAP. Um, there's a lot that we're gonna hammer out there and also with the um, educator housing that will be on the presentation. And I hope that we can take the educator housing uh, public um, to our community members who maybe uh, didn't realize it was on tonight's agenda and make sure that we are engaging folks from the get-go. So thank you. Thanks, Director Sina. Um, Vice President Brown. Thanks, President Albert. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out to give your public comments um, this evening. And as always, they did not fall on deaf ears. So thank you for taking the time um, out of your busy evenings to speak to us and to advocate um, around, the con around the things that you are, you're concerned about. Um, I wanna echo everything that my uh, school board directors have said, and starting with a congratulations to all of our graduates from the adult school to high school, to middle school, to elementary school, to preschool, and um, every single promotion in between, congratulations. You all made it. We are incredibly proud of you. Despite the challenges and the adversity um, that came your way, not just um, this year, but last year and the years before, you stood your ground. You persevered, you made your way through and your efforts are to be commended. So congratulations to all of our graduates um, and to our very own student director, Miles Miller. I, I just have to echo everything that our school board director said about you. You are a jewel and we in BUSD are really, really lucky to have had you. The, the students that you represent are lucky to have um, had the opportunity to have you as a representative we as school board directors um, and our work is so much richer because of you and because of the ways um, that you showed up and helped to inform our work and the ways that you worked with us collectively or collaboratively. And so I'm so proud of you. Um, there are not many young people that come with your skills, with your skill set, um, and you used it not just to advocate um, for the students in your grade, but all of the students um, in the high school and um, in the Greater Berkeley Unified School District community. So you are an amazing shining star and I can't wait to see um, how far you will go. Just remember to always wave because we'll be right behind you supporting you all along the way. Um, in addition to saying congratulations, we can't say it without saying thank you um, to, our, to our stakeholders in the persons of parents and guardians, um, faculty and staff. This has been a tremendous and dynamic year for all of us. And so thank you for, for holding your children um, down and for ensuring that we all made it through. Um, and finally, I would just like to um, thank Director Vasudev and, uh, Director, and President Alper for their work um, on the resolution that, we're com that is coming forth to us this evening. Um, and to also say happy Pride Month uh, to everyone as a, as a proud ally, happy Pride Month. And then finally to Director Vasudev, thank you so much for allowing me um, to support and partner with you on the resolution um, that is being presented this evening. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Um, you are an incredible representative and someone that's been really, really wonderful to work with on this. So thank you um, for, for including me and for bringing it forward um, at such a necessary time as this one. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Brown. I'm happy pride, everybody. Director Vasudev likes to give me more credit than I deserve. Um, it was really her leadership that um, led to the resolution that's on our consent calendar for, um, for Pride Month. Um, and um, we'll get to it, but my thanks to her and Vice President Brown um, and, and many community members for their work on the Latinx resolution. Um, Director Miller, um, I echo everything everyone said, um, except for the part about you being the mini me, that was that was an uncalled for um, insult to you. Um, but uh, you um, you're everything everybody said and 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 more. And and many people I think wish that after you led the meeting last time that you continued to lead um, over the next three meetings. But this is your last meeting, so I guess you won't be able to um, take over, but you did an amazing job as Director Sinai said, and, um, and it was just indicative of the work that you've done on this board 
all year during, as you mentioned, really a, a sort of unexpected and, and challenging times. And for you to say that to come out of this year saying that you want to do the do more of this um, is really a testament um, to you. Um, and, it, and I don't know, we if we were in person, um, we would have a plaque for you. Did you get the plaque? Okay, you got the plaque. Do you have it there? Um, wait, hold on, give me a second. <laughs> you don't keep it, you don't you haven't like tethered it to your to your wrist ever since it arrived at your house earlier today? Where'd he go? Wait, sorry, the screen's off. This okay. one, right? Yeah, yeah, that one. Okay. Um, so we won't make you read it. If we were, if one of us was actually giving it to you, we would read it, but we can all assume that it says something appropriately ceremonial um, and complimentary, but we're, um, we're, we're happy to be able to physically give you something, even if we have to give it to you virtually. And our thanks to Ms. Chiris for making that happen. Um, um, and, and you're off to Wesleyan, right? Uh, yep, East Coast, uh, it'll be cold. <laughs> all right, well, you always have a home here. Um, and we're, and as everyone said, we're excited to see what you do. Um, I just wanna briefly um, uh, mention two other things. Um, I wanna thank our partners at the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, um, as well as our staff, Dr. Stevens and um, Assistant Superintendent Tobias Espinoza um, and our bargaining team and BFT's bargaining team for all their work to reach a tentative agreement um, on a contract for next year. It was, it, this is, this followed months of, of what seemed like daily negotiations over um, reopening the schools. Um, as soon as that finished, we went into negotiations for our contract for next year. Um, and we're really excited that we were able to reach an agreement prior to the end of the school year. So thank you to our partners at BFT and to our own staff. Um, and then I wanted to just mention that on the um, information calendar um, is a revision to our um, TWI admission, two-way two immersion admissions um, policy that um, we had one public comment, I think Ms. Melendez Canales um, referred to it. We put it on the um, information calendar for tonight. Um, it was only uploaded um, recently. So we're gonna put it on the information calendar again for June 9th, just to make sure that everyone has time to, um, to digest it. And then we'll vote um, hopefully to approve it at our last meeting on June 23rd. And um, a lot of work went into that. Um, um, revision. It was approved by the policy subcommittee, which is myself and Director Vasudev, um, but the actual work um, was done by a number of um, a key staff, including Gloria Munoz, Mary Patterson, Francisco Martinez, um, Principal Valerio, Principal Furlan, Dr. Stevens. Um, am I missing anybody? Director Vasudev or Dr. Stevens? I got everybody. Okay. Um, and then a number of people who came to our meetings. We had, I don't know, three or four policy committee meetings where um, parents and some and some other staff came and, and participated. Um, and it was really helpful and a really rich, engaging discussion um, to improve our program and to better reflect the demographics of the district and to provide a, um, a pathway for our Spanish language heritage learners um, to enroll in the program. Um, so um, I wanted to highlight that. And I think with that, I'm, um, I will turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Steven. Um, thank you very much, President Alper, and good evening, everybody. It's um, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm also going to start by um, thanking you, Miles, um, for all of the, the work um, that you and I have had a chance to do together over the course of this year. Um, I know for members of the public that they're familiar now with the level of integrity you bring to being a student director, your ability to question us staff members about things that are important. Um, but there's been so many um, efforts that you've made behind the scenes that I think have been so meaningful and have contributed over the course of this year. Um, I think unlike um, any student director I've seen before, you've really functioned as a bridge between the district and the student body, uh, bringing them to us, bringing us to them, uh, and ensuring that we have direct lines of communication with Berkeley High School students and many others uh, as we contemplate decisions that were so important over the course of this last year. Um, and then I've also had a chance to see um, how you will invest your time uh, in individuals' advocacy causes to be sure that even individual students feel well taken care of um, as they cope with particular particular challenges in their life or seek to make change at the school. Uh, and in all of those ways, I think you've really made a, a big difference. Um, I would love it if you would send us a picture about mid-February as you're standing in waist deep snow. Uh, we all wanna see that as you're sort of enduring a Connecticut winter. Um, we'll smile back at you, uh, but good luck to you. And we really do appreciate all of your work this year. 
Um, I want to call out a few people, just like my um, uh, governance team colleagues, um, a few folks maybe that, that um, sort of haven't gotten the call outs, um, but, but nonetheless deserve them. Um, there's a, a good body of people right now who, even as we wind up wrapping up the school year, are gearing up for summer school. Uh, and so there's a few folks like Aaron Jorgensen, one of our staff members, Brazil McIntyre, Angie Wan, who have been working for year, uh, months now uh, to be able to offer an expanded portfolio of summer programs. Uh, they've been organizing partnerships, expanding our own staffing, um, and, and launching what is a very impressive catalog of summer offerings across all of our different levels. So thanks to that team. Uh, and for folks who are looking for summer opportunities, please do check our website. Um, there's a detailed catalog of all of our summering offerings, summer offerings uh, there. Um, on Friday, um, we're not only saying goodbye to this year's crop of seniors, congratulations to all of you, but we're also saying goodbye for the time being to all of our teachers. Uh, they'll be wrapping up a year. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, last summer there was a meme flying around the internet uh, being passed along among teachers. Um, this particular image was a huge wave crashing on the beach with a little kid stand standing underneath it. Um, and somebody had added the text, the 2021 school year. Um, Vice President Brown, I don't know if you got that one, but it was certainly making its rounds among teachers. Um, so here we are a year later, um, we survived together in that great big wave. Um, it turns out that it was quite a year. I think everybody sort of successfully anticipated that we'd have a lot of challenges. So to all of our teachers who are heading off for a well-deserved summer, um, congratulations and thank you to all of you. Um, we've been noticing all of your compassion, all of the long hours, all of the extra efforts that you've been making on behalf of our kids and families and, and feel deep gratitude towards all of you. Um, and then also um, on the unsung hero list of the evening, because we're doing it, um, I want to call out uh, the union presidents, our four colleagues, um, who have themselves been, um, you know, under a great deal of pressure, um, both to represent their members effectively, um, to contend with the various needs in our community, um, and to support a uh, district I know that all, every one of them cares a great deal about. Um, so to our BFT, Local 21, BCCE, and Yuba colleagues, the president, um, thank you very much for what I think has also been an extraordinary year of partnership and leadership. I know you don't hear that very often from us, but please know that we appreciate being able to work through this year with all of you. Uh, this evening, we're looking forward to a lot of interesting conversations. We're about to begin a conversation about school reopening. Um, we'll jump into a very detailed conversation about our local control accountability plan and the budget. So we encourage everybody to stay tuned, please, uh, as we go through what will continue to be very interesting uh, month of planning uh, uh, for the 21-22 school year. So with that, um, President Alper, thanks very much. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. And just to call them out by name, it's... Um, Frank Hernandez from BCCE, Matt Meyer, BFT, Steve Collins, Local 21, and Janet Levinson from our um, Administrators Union, Yuba. So thank you for mentioning them. Um, all right, um, thanks everybody. Now we will um, go move to our consent calendar. Um, I wanted to note, um, Director Sun, I mentioned the calendar, um, the amended school board meeting calendar, the, the attachment didn't actually make it onto the agenda. So we'll we'll add it to next week's agenda to just to make sure that the public is aware that we're moving that one meeting. And um, um, that was a great idea that we had uh, to do. Um, I'm just kidding, it was Director Sinai's um, suggestion that we do that. Um, all right, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? And, and, I, and just to remind everyone, item 11, Point twenty is also removed. I'll move it. All right, Director Stein. Second. Second by Vice President Brown. Ms. Chires. Director Miller. Yes. Director Vasude. Yes. Director Babbitt. Staying. That was at an abstention. Uh, Director Sinai. Yes. Vice President Brown? Yes. And President Alper? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we'll move right along to um, item 12.1. Um, Dr. Stevens, I'll turn it over to you. This is, well, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen.
Uh, so we're very glad to have the opportunity to um, offer some updates this evening. Um, particularly, we hope to talk about um, two topics uh, in some level of detail. Um, so I'll again sort of offer a reassertion of our um, fall reopening plans. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, uh, developing plans for independent study in the 21-22 school year. Uh, we'll walk through um, what appears to be coming state law that will make independent study the only permissible form of remote learning in the 21-22 school year, uh, and some changes contemplated by the legislation about independent study. Uh, for that discussion, I'm glad that we have our um, Berkeley Independent Study Principal Heidi Weber with us. Ms. Weber, uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, and then uh, we'll move from that discussion over to uh, uh, update on um, conversations taking place at Berkeley High School uh, to modify the bell schedule in the 21-22 school year. Uh, this is meant to capitalize on some of the sort of uh, happy achievements that we've made related to our um, bell schedule this year. Uh, and to try and maintain some of the sort of forward progress that we've made. So um, joining us for this discussion is the principal of Berkeley High School, Mr. Juan Regosa. Uh, and then we have two of our teacher leaders, Ms. Susie Lopez and Ms. Amanda Toprek. So thank you to all of you for also joining us this evening. So with that, I'm gonna jump in and we'll be turning it over to our guests very shortly. So just to reiterate, um, as we have been doing over the course of many board meetings, um, all of our Berkeley Unified families should be planning to return for a full return to school. Um, this will mean five days a week uh, at the normal daily start and end times at all of our levels. Um, uh, please do know that this is going to happen. Um, we are anticipating that we will be back five full days. Um, so we hope all of our families have a wonderful summer, um, rest up and have a good time together. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you um, back at our normal start time uh, on all of our campuses for a normal school day. Uh, as the summer progresses, we commit to offering updates about health guidance um, as they, we anticipate it will be amended over the course of the summer. Uh, but at this point, we feel very confident that this is the plan. Um, and so please do know that that is where we're going. So with that, I um, plan now to um, invite Ms. Heidi Weber, um, Principal of Berkeley Independent Study, um, to talk a little bit about uh, um, some sort of uh, some changes taking place. And Ms. Weber, you and I have not had the opportunity to do any rehearsal this evening. Um, are you comfortable sort of going through uh, these first couple of slides or should I do that? Um, it would be great if you did it and I, I'm welcome. I'm happy to, to chime in if you want me to. That's perfect, great. Um, so the first three slides um, we offer to the community are just meant to um, sort of represent both um, current regulations as it relates to independent study um, and then anticipated changes to the education code for independent study. Um, I'll say again, the reason we're talking about in, independent study um, is um, because at the legislative level through ed code, um, it appears that the state of California is going to use our independent study framework uh, as next year's model for distance learning or for remote learning. Um, no longer is it going to be an expectation that schools offer a distance learning program, but are rather using a somewhat modified independent study framework for those limited number of families um, who may be looking for some remote option in the coming school year. So represented here on this slide are current aspects of the independent study regulations here in the, in the state of California. Uh, you will hear Ms. Weber talk a little bit more about how uh, we're thinking currently about offering these, um, these sort of two forms of independent study, um, what, um, what we're calling an assisted home program and a course-based program. Uh, and then you'll also hear some small, slight modifications based on um, what we anticipate to be coming regulations. Um, on that topic, um, we are right now reading trailer bill language, so not yet official language, but trailer bill language that um, uh, essentially sort of modifies the independent study framework for the 21-22 school year. Um, specifically, um, uh, there is language that um, says that independent study can be offered to students whose health would be put at risk from in-person instruction. Uh, and that this is uh, coming on the request of a parent or guardian. Again, we are learning more about this as we offer this information to the Board of Education, but this is our current read on the trailer bill language. Um, it also then um, creates some new requirements for independent study, um, some of which are similar to distance learning, uh, including things like live instruction via Zoom at least once per week um, and logging participation and engagement. Uh, and that particular requirement is listed over on the right-hand box. 
So we'll continue to offer more information as we get it. Um, as we take a look um, still at the trailer bill language, let's um, sort of have a peek at some of the specific ed code provisions uh, that could be modified. Um, so one, uh, that health is specified as a reason for participating in independent study. Um, so this again um, may impact some of those families whose, um, whose ongoing health concerns may prevent or, or that they may prefer uh, to select a remote learning option. Um, uh, also amendments or anticipated amendments to the ed code with respect to educational rigor, um, a tiered re-engagement procedure, uh, meaning if a student um, is uh, sort of absent or misses classes that the independent study program has a re-engagement process. That there must be live interaction and synchronous instruction at least one time per week. Uh, and that families who wish to transition from independent study to in-person study uh, will have that opportunity available to them on an ongoing basis. Um, as well, um, there uh, are anticipated updates to the written agreement related to independent study, um, including communication with the parent or guardian, um, providing connectivity and devices to our students, much as we did over the course of the last year, uh, as well as other academic support. Um, and then finally, um, new requirements related to documentation that have to do not only with um, attending weekly sessions, but also about daily participation and engagement. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Ms. Weber. She'll walk us again through some of the current sort of features of our Berkeley Independent Study Program, and then we'll talk about some of what we're planning at the moment. Uh, so Ms. Weber, over to you. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, so this is just a reminder, a couple of weeks ago when we were here, we, we described what we do now. Um, so in our K-8 program, it's, it's an assisted homeschool program. And in that program, um, the BIS teacher is the coach and really um, supports the, the home teacher. Um, a parent has to be available to be the home teacher. Um, and so the, the BIS teacher coach provides curriculum for the home teacher and um, the home teacher does the teaching and supervises the instruction. And then our BI, BIS teacher um, assesses uh, student progress every week um, they have a, um, a meeting once a week for an hour and a half. Um, and then the home um, teacher, the parent, and the student are, are um, agreeing to do 24 hours of, of work together a week um, to be able to participate in this program. Um, so um, in other years, this is a very small program. This year, um, the program was expanded and got up to 40 families. Um, so that, that was a different um, thing that happened this year. And then our BIS 912 program for uh, high school students, um, it, it happens where students meet uh, once or twice a week for the, um, their classes. The classes are usually um, an hour and a half and students take at least three classes a quarter. Um, the BIS high school program is a program of Berkeley High. Um, students who stay with us and graduate get a a Berkeley High diploma, and students can also take one or two classes at Berkeley High instead of taking them all with us. Um, students take home uh, 30 hours of homework each week for 10 hours per class, so it's, it's a, a big commitment. Um, and families sign an agreement, a contract that says that they will be able to support their student with a daily um, check-in to monitor progress and, and support them. Next slide. So um, when we're thinking about next year, um, one model is that for families who have personal reasons not to um, join um, everyday school at um, Berkeley High or at one of the middle schools or at the elementaries, that they actually can choose um, independent study as it is. And that might be that they have a personal reason not for being in school um, every day. And so just having less contact in a very small setting, um, you know, if it's K-8, it's, it's one teacher, one parent, one student. Um, it, it, this is one of our, our options for families. And so, like I said, this year we added um, two additional teachers, point, um, two additional part-time teachers, a 0.7 FTE, and next year we could add, um, you know, a, a 1.0 FTE and, and have it available for 20 students. Um, and, and again, kind of those are the features of our, our program as it is. 
Um, and we use the K-5 and 6-8 curriculum um, from Berkeley High, or excuse me, from Berkeley Unified. Um, so the, the, our teachers work closely with the math um, and literacy coaches and also teacher leaders um, at, at the elementary and middle schools. Um, we also do uh, the, the assessments and the writing scoring and, and professional development with um, elementary schools. Um, we do have some, some um, enrichment program as a part of our program, Art and Gardening. And um, also our fourth through fifth graders are um, able to participate in the music program, which is a, an excellent opportunity. So currently, um, if families are interested in independent study um, and, and it's a voluntary program, um, they, either the admissions office um, refers them to us or they find out us, about us through word of mouth or on our website. They come to an orientation, do the application, um, schedule classes with a counselor, or if it's K-8 with our teacher leader, um, and then they sign a contract agreement. Um, and that's a part of board policy for any independent study and ed code. And then students are accepted at first come first serve until each program is full. Um, usually the high school fills up at about 175 students um, in the, and we fill up in the spring. And again, the, the K-8 is a smaller program usually. Um, and then when families leave independent study um, and the original school placement is not guaranteed, but they go back into um, you know, in the enrollment process with admissions and then um, are placed in a school where there's availability. And that's something we talk about when they come in. Um, and then the, the last reminder, and I talk about this at orientations as well, is that students that with IEPs must have an IEP team meeting um, before transferring. And the IEP team de determines if, if independent study is an appropriate um, program for the student to participate in. And that, that language is important um, and that process is important. And that's something um, we've done in our current program, but it, it is a part of um, ed code. And um, we're checking with our, SELPA that we're, we're a part of, um, Sean is doing that um, to, you know, to make sure that we're following whatever um, rules that are, are going to happen um, in this new virtual academy model. Um, so we, we're, that's important to us. Um, this will then, a gentle yeah. time check. We might, we might need yeah. to keep it moving along. Yes, yes. And you. do you want me to take the slide or do you want to talk about this one? Uh, I, I, I'm happy to jump in. Okay, go ahead. So, so um, currently in discussion is a potential second model for Berkeley Independent Study, and that that is the idea of a virtual academy. Um, this is an idea that um, we're right now sort of pl playing with. Um, we're imagining that this might be specific to families who have a documented medical reason why they can't attend in person. Uh, we're imagining this being uh, is relevant to the elementary level um, for roughly the equivalent of three teachers. Um, we could create several combination grade level classes um, and replicate uh, something similar to the distance learning schedule. Um, so here you can see roughly the capacities that we would create with a single teacher uh, in a combo class, K1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, uh, gives us the capacity of roughly 70 students or so um, to be served in uh, something more akin to our current distance learning program. Um, we are still studying this. Um, we will ultimately be making some, um, putting out some information to families and conducting some live informational sessions for them um, prior to referring folks to our enrollment office to to enroll either in independent studies, this first model, or should we go in this direction, uh, the second model of the virtual academy. Um, if we do this virtual academy, we imagine that it's going to have some limitations. Um, we do think that we'll have to reserve some seats in case of ongoing transfers. Um, that students who apply and qualify for the BIS Virtual Academy um, would be assigned only to that program, uh, and that it would not be possible to enroll both in a virtual academy and save a seat at their, at their current 2021 school. Um, and then for students who enroll in a virtual academy or an independent study, um, there is no sort of quote unquote right of return. We won't be able to save a seat in, a, in an original school. Um, we do want to accommodate transfers, but it may not be back to the original school from which a, a, a student has come. 
Um, and then uh, with respect to a virtual academy, uh, we do imagine that for students who qualify for this particular program and have special education services that they're an IEP team meeting would need, uh, need to take place uh, in order to consider services to take place in this particular format. Uh, we do anticipate that we've got some challenges in front of us. Um, I've listed a few of them here. Um, they include the possibility of a family who has a documented medical condition and is in TWI, EL students, students, as I just discussed, who get special education students, or rather services, um, and then enrichment uh, sort of experiences as they um, are carried out on our elementary campuses, we don't imagine uh, can take place in the BIS setting in the same way. So Ms. Weber previously described what, in, what enrichment is part of the independent study program, but we don't anticipate we could replicate the full elementary enrichment experience for students who are in this, ex, this program. So by way of next steps, um, we know that we have further communication to do with our families. Um, we're uh, trying now to um, sort of work out um, some of these detailed questions about how this will operate. Um, we need as well to consider some form of administrative support. And then we are waiting for updates to the Ed Code about independent study, which we expect on June 14th. Uh, and like we've been so many times before it, we're sort of in the process of both planning and waiting for concrete guidance, uh, a challenging situation for sure. I'm gonna propose um, that we stop at this point, given that we've shared a lot of information about independent study, um, uh, that we take a few questions and then we'll proceed into the conversation about uh, uh, potential changes to the bell schedule at Berkeley High. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Stevens and, and Ms. Weber. Um, and we'll take some questions and, and um, this will be the first of probably many reminders about how packed an agenda we have tonight. Um, all right, Director Vasudev, I see your hand. Thank you, Superintendent Stevens and um, Ms. Weber. I really appreciate your presentation and the overview and preview of what's to come with independent study. I'll ask all my questions in one go. So <laughs> I have two questions, both related to special education. And so Ms. Weber, can you give me one, just like a quick overview of how um, SPED services have worked this year in independent study? I just like at a high level, what does it look like when you have an IEP? And I know it's hard to answer that question without going into the specific IEP, but just, you know, in general, just how services have been working right now during this year. Um, and then with the virtual academy, thanks Superintendent Stevens for including some of the challenges um, that you see, you know, with that model. But I'd like to know, have we factored in additional staff costs for, for additional SPED services for, you know, what, what that model would look like in the fall? So kind of like, is there a need for increased SPED in the fall with the virtual academy? And what does SPED look like now in independent study? So I can answer um, pretty quickly what special ed um, looks like now. And it, it's really about where the student came from. So if they came from Berkeley High, then the case manager um, had followed them from Berkeley High um, and works with them and provides their, um, you know, their, edu their um, services and um, whether that's, you know, meeting once a week or, or a counselor provides um, mental health um, um, support because that's a part of their IEP. Um, next year, um, Eileen Jacobs and Sean are looking at um, having a dedicated um, part-time um, uh, ed education specialist be actually at on the, the independent study site um, to be able to, to support um, students with at independent study. So um, we're looking forward to that. And it's somebody that we've worked with um, many times before, so he, he knows about the high school. Um, and then similarly for the middle school and elementary school, if there's a student with an IEP, then the services follow the student um, from that school. So we haven't had a dedicated team for the, um, the K-8 assisted homeschool. It's, again, before this year, it's been very small. And then Director Vasudev, to answer your question, we're, we're not sure yet. Um, this is one of those supply and demand questions. We're not sure how many families um, would likely opt into this. Um, we do know from our preliminary surveys that it's about 10% of our current DL students, distance learning students, um, would likely for medical reasons, select at least in the early portion of the school year, some kind of remote option. Um, so we can extrapolate a little bit by that. And we think we're in the ballpark by way of scale. Um, but haven't yet worked through those details. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, my, my question was because I'm curious if we need additional like elementary school age like SPED services, but 
it's like we're gathering the data. Uh, it's a question on our mind as well. Thank you, Dr. Sinai. Thank you, uh, Principal Weber and Dr. Stevens. I, I have a couple questions too. Um, one is good segue from what Dr. Stevens was just saying. If I recall from the DL survey that we talked about at one of our previous meetings is a fairly small percent of families responded to that survey. Um, so I, I'm a little hesitant to hang my hat on the number. Um, and I think part of the challenge is the transparency and knowing what their what they what their options are, because uh, a real fear of signing up for something that they don't know, you know, they don't know what it is. So I understand the outline for the for the the current independent study model, um, which seems really clear, which is very different from a distant learning model where you're with a group of kids in a class with a teacher. Um, so. <clears throat> I, I have a I have a assumption that a lot of the families who are currently in distance learning, having that kind of um, home teacher with once a week visit with the, the in person teacher is not necessarily the experience that they're looking for for their child. Um, could you talk a little bit when we're looking at the ed code and we're looking at the legislation that's coming down is part is part of the issue whether ADA will be able to be generated, um, average daily attendance for revenue for a distance learning model, and we don't have that answer yet? That's one of our challenges, Director Sinai, is, is that that has not been answered. Um, we're trying to interpret statements like independent study will be the only available mode of remote education that comes from the governor. Um, and we're reading trailer bill language, but we don't yet have final word. And so yet again, we're in this sort of difficult planning stage where we don't have concrete rules, but still need to plan. So, right. And so we'll know the budget gets signed at the end of the month. Um, so if we're doing planning on a model to be able to at least tell folks that the model is similar to what we've got now, kind of like what you've laid out with the high, you know, the classes. Um, I think that's helpful. I wondering when you're thinking you might do another survey um, with maybe the caveat that we still don't know, you know, so that people don't end up at the, you know, in July and they still don't have a sense of what it is. So that's one question. And the other thing is, could there be a hybrid around the enrichment? I think, um, Principal Weber, you said that the Berkeley Independent Study right now has um, opportunities for enrichment, art, and music, I think. If the distance learning can't incorporate art or music, um, would there be a way maybe to leverage with the independent study um, art and music program to kind of cross, cross over, cross fertilize with the um, instructors there? I think we we are, we are just at the beginning part of exploring, you know, which teacher, teachers might be able to do additional, um, you know, hours or FTE to be able to provide enrichment. It, it, this year in distance learning, I, I got to meet with Michelle Sinclair. She was very gracious with her time. She just really talked about, you know, the amazing opportunities for enrichment. And I got to talk to Keisha Jackson, who was one of the teachers, and um, that was an important part of their program all of those teachers are scheduled to go back to their places in regular schools. So we're just trying to figure out, and, and you know, I've started to reach out to people um, who are some teachers that would like some more hours or some more FT, or will we have to hire for that? Um, so that includes our art and gardening and um, teachers at BIS. Like, will they want to do more? And Dr. Stevens, are you thinking about when you might be able to gather more information from families? Um, yeah, so I, uh, what I'm imagining is um, time in June, um, likely where we would set up specific town hall live inter informational sessions, probably hosted by, by Principal Weber and myself, um, where we can both lay out the thinking of model one, the sort of traditional independent study program, um, and then be able to both explain what a virtual academy might look like uh, and begin to collect some information about it. Um, we will ultimately, I think, ask folks to register formally through our enrollment office, uh, because unlike distance learning, this is going to be a change in educational program, meaning they'll be transferring from their school into independent study, which is different from selecting a model but remaining in the same home school. 
Okay, I would like us to move on if we if we could. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Dr. Stevens, to continue on. I don't know if it's maybe Mr. Regosa, um, the Berkeley High part of this. Yep, it is. Um, so why don't I, um, I think I'm just handing this over at this point to our Berkeley High School colleagues. Um, so once again, we're joined by the principal of the high school, Juan Regosa, and we have two teacher leaders from Berkeley High as well, Ms. Susie Lopez, uh, and we have Amanda Toporek here this evening with us. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit about conversations taking place inside the uh, Berkeley High School to be able to capture um, some of the benefits that we experienced as we um, sort of modified our bell scarves or our, our our bell schedule for the 2021 school year. Um, so Mr. Regos, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let the team walk us through this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, and thank you everyone else who's on here. Really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you all tonight. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Amanda Toporek, uh, one of our amazing teacher leaders at BHS, who's gonna start off the presentation. Um, hi all, thanks for having us. I'm Amanda Toporek. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a teacher leader at Berkeley High, and I um, also teach in the Arts and Humanities Academy, as well as our uh, multilingual program. Um, and if you could take us to the next slide, Dr. Stevens. Thank you. Um, so um, as Dr. Stevens mentioned at the start of this, we are all within the framework of going back to school five days a week. Um, this presentation is not about whether or not we'll be, you know, filling the whole um, school day. It is about how we fill that school day. Um, and there has been a lot of energy at Berkeley High in a lot of directions around how we use that time and transition back to school in person full time. Um, so I would say that energy is, is twofold, like Dr. Stevens mentioned. It's maintaining some of the positive developments from this year. But the second component is, is really considering student needs as we transition out of a pandemic and consider how can we meet the needs of our students and our community um, in next year, which will also surely be a unique year and a transition year for all of us. So some of the things that this model um, that Mr. Regosa will talk about address it, addresses are um, having longer class periods, slowing down the school day a little bit, um, giving students some time to digest the, the content that they're receiving, um, fewer classes at a time, fewer classes in a day, and then greater support and flexibility for our students. That's something we're all thinking about right now. How can we support our students academically and emotionally as we transition back to school full time coming out of a, a traumatic year? Um, and that leads into the last point on here, right? That academic and emotional support in the school day. So I'm gonna share this next slide, a little bit about the process overview of how we got to tonight. Um, the process to change a bell schedule at a high school can typically take anywhere from a year to, to two years. And it can involve standing committees, it can involve site visits to other schools to see how their models are actually looking like on the ground, uh, countless surveys, presentations. Um, we don't have that time and it's not ideal what we do have. But we do know as, as Mr. Pork just mentioned that we have a lot of energy uh, to make some change. And, and especially, I think everyone agrees uh, that we can't go back to normal. Uh, because normal wasn't working for so many of our students and it wasn't sustainable for so many of our educators. And so I think we had to harness that energy even with a not so ideal timeline. And so in late April, um, I solicited representatives from the small learning communities and departments to form what was just a working group. Uh, we have over 20 teacher leaders that are elected by departments and SLCs at BHS. And so I asked either for them to be representatives or to send somebody to this working group. Um, we met in late April to come up with a survey on, on all kinds of questions that we would ask our staff about, about what they're thinking about for next year, uh, how they view longer periods, what are some of the benefits from the current term schedule, the eight term schedule that we have at BHS right now, what are some of the drawbacks, and what are some of the things that they believe our students will most need when it comes to the fall semester. Um, we then analyzed the data from staff and, and it really came down to looking at two different models to build out. And that is uh, another term or quarter system. Uh, but unlike the term system that we have now, we'd be working with a full day. So it wouldn't be just in person from 8.30 to 
1230 and then and then sorry virtual and then in person in the afternoon it'd be a full 830 to 330 day in person but broken down in terms um, and the second one would be to have a block system um, so to have all classes at all times perhaps just on alternating days um, one of the important things to keep in mind is even as we were talking about alternative models we all recognize that the traditional schedule from 1920 is still the fallback. That is what, what we fall back to if we don't reach an agreement on an alternative model um, for a bell schedule. Um, so then I took these models back to the teacher leaders for some feedback, tweaked them a bit, and then sent it back out to the staff. So this all happened within a matter of weeks for ranked choice voting. So we asked all of our staff members uh, to rank the different models uh, that we put out there, uh, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And then we looked at the results. Uh, we started to eliminate the one that got the least most votes and then see how they, they, they do as the voting goes on. Um, we put forward several models, uh, including ones that have flex, which we're gonna talk about. Most people might know it as an advisory type class um, and some schedules that did not have flex. Um, again, we also reminded staff that we have the traditional six period a day schedule um, as an option. Um, and so having done all that, I then bring a model that that got uh, a lot of support from our staff here today um, to present to all of you. Um, there were a lot of ideas thrown around throughout these weeks uh, from staff. Um, and uh, one thing to keep in mind is that because we started in late April, we could only get so creative uh, throughout the spring, starting after winter break, our counselors had been working with all of our students, our current ninth, 10th, 11th graders, as well as our rising ninth graders from the middle schools to collect course requests. And so um, there are schedules that some other schools use that have, for example, um, eight periods. Um, and so for that, it would have been difficult in late April to do because all of our students had already chosen six year long courses. We of course know there's a handful of seniors that might have five classes, which lets them have an open first or an open sixth. But the fact that our students had chosen six courses, um, the fact that our contract still has full time teachers teaching five classes and one prep, we couldn't get two outside of the box. Um, and as uh, Mr. Porig said, we're committed to having a full school day. Uh, so we were constrained with those factors. Hi, my name is Susie Lopez and I'm a Spanish teacher at Berkeley High School. I am also a co-lead for the World Languages Department. And um, Amanda Toporic and I participated in a fishbowl um, with students that were pulled uh, from affinity groups and case managers and counselors. It was a very, very diverse uh, group of students. And these students were um, very thoughtful and um, students with uh, strong opinions and with a really deep sense of what worked for them this year and what didn't. So we had some reflection questions that we asked of them. And uh, these questions really wanted to get at uh, the successes that they experienced and also some of the challenges that they face. Um, uh, this one of the things that the students uh, mentioned that was really important and really enlightening was that uh, they wanted to keep uh, a sense of um, help and support, uh, like we what we had on Wednesdays. Um, this was a time for students to get caught up, uh, really build community with their peers, uh, connect with their teachers, and have some time to think about what they were doing and how they could do better. Um, so they express a really deep desire to keep this, uh, this part of distance learning. And we believe that um, Flex would do that for them. Uh, we also, um, uh, we, you know, in talking to the students, we wanted to make sure that we heard from students that have IEPs. Uh, something that was really important that the students with IEPs mentioned was that they felt that the periods as they are, are feel very rushed for them. So the idea of having a block schedule, having longer periods is really something that they would like to see um, because it would give them time to connect with their teachers and also just 
think more deeply about what they're learning. Um, and, you know, lunch is something that the students want, want us to think about uh, because it feels like something that's really uh, stressful for them and they, um, they want to continue to do well in school, even though the year was really challenging. They feel that the, they did really well, they learned a lot, um, and going back is one of the things that they want us to think uh, deeply about. Thank you. So what you see here um, is is uh, the current thinking about a possible alternative to the to the traditional six period a day schedule from 1920. And so I want to go through it a little bit just to kind of uh, have us visualize what the day would look like and what the week would look like for all of our students and our staff. Um, so on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we would have alternating, you know, A or B days or red and gold days. Um, and so on a typical Monday. Uh, we would start at 8.30 and we would have a hundred minute first period on Monday. We would then have a 10 minute passing period um, and go into flex, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, that would be a 50 minute period. Then we would have lunch for 40 minutes um, from 11.10 to 11.50 and then return for third period again on Monday for a hundred minutes and in fifth period on uh, Monday for 100 minutes and end at 3.30. So again, this is a commitment to going back to a full day of education. On Tuesday, that alternates to periods two, flex, four, and six. Same thing on Thursday, back with periods one, flex, three, five, and on Friday, periods two, flex, four, six. So flex meets for 50 minutes a day for four days a week, and each class meets twice a week for 100 minutes at a time. Um, this is different than what we have currently where we have eight terms, which are spaced out between four to five and a half weeks. So we would not go four to five and a half weeks between seeing any of your teachers or, or you know, becoming familiar with any of the content. Um, however, instead of sticking to such a strict schedule where every Monday is one, three, five and Tuesdays two, four, six, we're already thinking about the fact that if you look at next year's calendar, we have 11 days on Monday when students do not have school. Nine of those are holidays. So there's two where staff are on campus doing professional development, but students are not. If we kept to a strict schedule, um, then periods one, three, and five would lose 11 days of instruction. So what we propose, and we would lay this out in a visual so it becomes very clear, and I think everyone would catch on pretty quickly, is it, it rotates throughout the year. So using this last weekend as, as an example, Friday would end on periods two, four, and six. Monday was a holiday. So therefore, Tuesday would be red day with periods one, three, five. Eventually, there's about a Monday or two off every month you would catch up. Um, and so you wouldn't actually miss any instructional days because of Monday holidays. What you see on the right side of this screen is our Wednesdays. We would have all six periods. This looks more like a typical day from the traditional schedule of 1920. They're 41 minute long um, with six minute passing periods. And we have PD in the afternoon. So we've gotten some feedback from staff, um, uh, preference for professional development happening. This is when students are not in classes in the afternoon rather than in the morning. I think um, as a teacher in the morning, you know, you're thinking about copies you have to make or getting ready for class. Uh, so having that on Wednesdays, additionally, by having professional development on Wednesdays, we don't lose nine Mondays. Uh, that gives us back about 12 hours of professional development for our staff. And we know that that's gonna be important as we embark on a new student information system and we need a lot of training. Um, so the flex is a very interesting uh, component as, as we'll show on the next slide. Um, we've had a lot of lingering questions, which we know we absolutely need to address. And that is, how are we gonna address uh, the, the, the um, less instructional minutes this year with academics as far as how students arrive in the fall? Um, how are we gonna address community building when a lot of our students, the overwhelming majority of our students have not been on campus now for a year and a half since March? Um, and uh, how are we gonna do trauma? How are we gonna engage in trauma for practices and, and social and emotional supports? And we believe that flex can be a time for all of this. Uh, it can be a time where students are with their teachers, uh, working on academics, 
having time to catch up, as Ms. Lopez said, bringing in organizations and trainers that work with students to return physically to campus and to process the grief that, that all of us have experienced. Um, if you're an educator, you also know that throughout the year, we have countless surveys to conduct, presentations to do, assemblies to carry out. Um, and normally certain content areas are hit the hardest, like history and English. Um, and so we wouldn't pull instructional time from classes, but we could hold a lot of this in flex. Um, and so what you see as some of our next steps, again, going back to the fact that this is not an ideal timeline, we have a lot of feedback we have to gather. So next steps, one is make sure we're in compliance with state requirements. Um, so we need to hit that 64,800 minute instructional uh, requirement and looking at our schedule and making sure it fits that. Um, we need to communicate with students and families and, and you will be getting surveys to give us feedback on this schedule um, and the different components that you saw today. Uh, there are a couple issues. There were, every model has questions that we have to figure out. And so there are a couple issues with the schedule that, that we need to overcome in order to make it possible for all of our educators to take part in it. Um, and flex. Uh, advisory is, is, is something that a lot of teachers know about, um, and we need to get it off the ground um, very well. And so I anticipate um, if we go with this model, uh, working with a small group of, of, of staff members on a curriculum that is made available to teachers so that it doesn't seem as another prep that they have to plan for, but also giving them the flexibility um, to work with their students, to see what their students need, um, at BHS, we have restorative restart funds, and we're going to start hopefully to build partnerships with local organizations that come in and provide supports to our students. So finding a way to fit that in with our curriculum um, for FLEX. So um, thank you very much, team. I'm going to propose now I'll unshare my screen and we can jump into discussion and questions. Yeah, thank you, um, Berkeley High staff and Dr. Stevens. Um, so this is on the agenda for discussion, the, um, the, the bell schedule um, at the high school um, isn't coming to the board for, for action, but it's an opportunity for us to ask questions and discuss. Um, so I, I see, I'm going to let Director Miller go first. Um, and I guess I'll just ask everybody to try to keep their comments and questions and answers too, if possible, um, concise, as we have a number of important things to to get to is in addition to this. So go ahead, Director Miller. Sorry, President Alper, I don't know if that will be able to happen for this item for me. But um, Okay, so thank you so much for the presentation. I really like how we're thinking and how we are taking what we've learned this year and moving it towards our future years. But I do have a couple concerns from the student perspective as well as other students have been telling me. Um, the first being sustained focus. I had block schedule earlier in my time in BUSD throughout King. And that 100 minute period, we one way we look at it is yes it's more instructional time but another time it is it is 100 minutes where a student has to sit in a single place and focus on a single subject and that is very difficult and i understand future endeavors future classes they take in higher education if they pursue higher education will have those longer minutes but in high school it's just really hard to get that right there and so that's a concern a bunch of students brought to me as well as continuity, you are dressed a little, Principal Rigozzi, you addressed a little bit Mondays off and how that will affect the schedule. But even so, students want a schedule next year that is just consistent. They don't want something that's constantly changing. They want something where they feel like they are seeing teachers every day, where they are practicing skills every day and doing things like that. And so that's why a bunch of students were, are wary about this because they want something that will feel consistent and feel like they can, you know, have something, because this year was not consistent by any means in all areas of life, and that's not what they want next year. And regarding um, this huge change, um, last one more thing after this, but regarding this huge change, um, you know, students want, of course, we'll never go back to the normal. This is the new normal. But students feel that they just want to go to the Berkeley High they know next year. And it's really hard for a lot of them to look at this and see no late start Monday and see that they won't be seeing a lot of their teachers every day during the week. and. Um, and while I feel like this is a great thinking and great like mindset of what we need to do in the future, I, I feel like you guys also said a little bit yourself, like the timeline we're on with planning this, it is very rushed and it's a much shorter amount of time than we would want it. And so a lot of what, what some a message I got exactly from a student was, you know, I like how this looks, but I don't feel like it's a right now sort of implementation. 
where they just don't know if this is the right time to do it. Like not never, but just currently they're unsure. Um, and I would like to say um, one more thing about the flex um, period. I think some kind of catch up period is a great idea, but it is taking a little bit of instructional minutes around 30 minutes from each class per week. So that is something that some students are also worried about as well. So that's kind of everything wrapped up into one. Thank you, Director Miller. Did uh, Mr. Regosa or or Mr. Parker um, or Mr. Lopez, do you, have, do you want to respond? Um, yeah, I mean, Miles, thank you so much for for sharing all that. I think we've we've been very thoughtful about the fact that uh, 100 minutes or longer, and it, it can feel even longer than that if you're just getting a lecture for 100 minutes. And so we, you know, we're committing ourselves in this change to go back to what good teaching is. And that's to, to capture you throughout those 100 minutes, to vary the activities throughout those 100 minutes, uh, and not to, to, to fall back to just speaking to you for 100 minutes. Um, and so that's that's our commitment to do, to go back to what, what best practice is. We, we know our teachers can rise to that occasion. Um, and I also I have one more comment about student engagement. I think tomorrow being, this is the last week of school, is a very important opportunity to get student engagement because I know if you, I think if you send a survey to students next week, first week of summer, like, I don't know what the response level is going to be. So I think, um, I'm sorry if one of the other teacher leaders were going to say something, I'm really sorry if I just interjected, but um, I also want to say tomorrow or Friday is a great opportunity just to get this out to students, like a quick survey, just are you interested in this or not? Because I think it's going to be very hard to get students together this summer to collectively answer all this. So my last comment. Is there is there a plan in the in the next couple of days to to capture more student impact? Uh, in there, yeah, there's a plan in the next couple of hours. We'll be working on the survey tonight, finalizing it tomorrow by eight thirty, and sending it out to staff and to family, to students and to families. Okay, great. Um, Director uh, Babbitt. Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, and it's a pleasure to meet many of you for the first time for me personally. Um, I also uh, wanted to echo the concerns around the late start on Monday that we will be losing in this plan and uh, was interested in what the focus group thought of that. And uh, secondly, just wanted to ask what um, school district did you model and what were their um, opportunity gap results or educational results um, using this model versus the traditional model? Did it do anything to improve educational outcomes? Um, thank you, Director Babbitt. Uh, during the focus group, um, the students did not make mention of uh, the loss of the uh, late start on Monday. That was not something that was prominently mentioned. Uh, what was mentioned time and time again was the importance of having a flex period. The students expressed uh, real interest in seeing the flex period. Um, in the middle of the day as something that they could go to and engage with their with their uh, teachers with their peers and just an opportunity to catch their catch their breath uh, really think about um, the work ahead of them and just a, a time to get support and one of the students said that um, they look forward to the opportunity of um, having a flex teacher that would create um, a calm setting um, a, a, a space to um, allow them to soothe their anxieties and their worries and start thinking about the work that they had to do uh, in the evening. So that was, it, it was really enlightening for me to hear them talk uh, so positively about that possibility. Yeah, and I'll just add from the student group about um, the Monday piece. Um, it was really interesting because they acknowledged what we experience as teachers, which is that they're late on Mondays too. Um, they said often like they, you know, set their alarm too early or too late. And some of them um, mentioned they actually appreciate a consistent start time. Um, I know Regosa can talk more specifically. We actually have data on Berkeley High when we didn't do a, a late start versus did do a late start. Um, but that was their feedback was they, they didn't care so much about losing that because they acknowledged they often are late on Mondays as well. And what about Director Babbitt's question about um, other districts or, or research supporting? I mean, I know this is not an uncommon um, high school 
model, but um, can you talk at all about whether you engaged in any research either either in the literature or in looking at other districts? Yeah, I mean, so so we we've, we've been working on this for about a, a little over a month, uh, about a month and a half, and that's that's exactly what we didn't have, you know, the the opportunity to do to really delve in and have conversations, either conference calls with other districts. We were looking at other models, and some of our staff members who know teachers at other models. Uh, we looked at El Cerrito High, for example. Um, they have a four block day and then they have the homeroom in the middle. Uh, and we started to, to raise also some of the concerns. And once we started looking at other ones, you know, they're, they're not perfect. Um, and we, we wanted to do something that, that works for us at this moment. Um, but it's definitely something that a longer conversation would, would, would allow us to do, to, to look at data and to see how does homeroom work for schools? Uh, what are some of the pitfalls that, that we hope to, to avoid starting out. Okay, um, Dr. Vasudev, thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Principal Regosa and all the staff for your work on this. I also um, wanted to give a, a big shout out to Ms. Susie Lopez for doing that affinity group engagement, which I think is really important. And I hope that it, we're planning on doing that with the parent community as well, right? Like when we do the parent survey, I think in particular, my questions are around special education and how we've engaged like parents on special education issues. And from a special education front, if we see that 100 minutes will be a long time for some of the students and how, how do we deal with some of you know, the, the common concerns expressed in IEPs and 504 plans. Um, I also feel, um, you know, I just want to echo what uh, Director Miller said about it feeling this is a really big decision, right? And we have very little time to kind of figure it out. I think at a high level, I really like the fact that we can do some deep teaching, um, you know, and making sure that our education is more meaningful. Um, but I'm concerned that a lot of the weeds haven't been figured out and we're still figuring them out. So I could see parents having questions around, you know, what are the flex time providers? And so do we have a preliminary list of providers? And on the SPED front, are we planning on engaging the parent affinity groups too, to understand maybe SPED specific concerns? So those are my two questions, like on SPED, and flex providers, even if it's a preliminary list, I think that would be really useful to, to give out to the community. Can I just ask for clarity what you mean by flex providers? Uh, the, for that flex time, like who do you, when you said we want to do like mental health care or like, you know, some of the other services that you mentioned, if we're going to work with community-based organizations, right? Like who are they? What are some of the organizations that you're thinking about? Um, for mental health, is it the clinic that's there already or is it an expansion and what does that look like? Just a little bit more specific so that, you know, parents and students can have a better understanding of what that time, you know, if it's, is it the teacher that's, be, you know, are we, is this going to be more work for the teacher to try to develop a curriculum during that flex time? Or is it external providers coming in to, to provide that and a relief for the teachers? I guess I'm having trouble kind of understanding that, so. Yeah, um, and, and uh, you know, I'd love um, for both Ms. Lopez as a world language teacher, Mr. Pork, and in the Arts uh, and Humanities Academy to chime in because I think one of the things we know about, about Berkeley High is, you know, most of our students fall into one of the five small learning communities, right? And so where I mentioned before the flexibility is um, advisory already falls in naturally with some of the work that, that the small learning communities are doing, and sometimes it doesn't. And so we don't wanna to be too rigid, but we do anticipate that it's a little bit of both. It is gonna be a little extra work, right? Um, because it's a new class uh, and you're gonna have your own students and they might be a mix of students if you're teaching multiple preps, right? Um, but we do also anticipate having a small group that does build out lessons um, that are relevant to whatever's coming up in school and also, uh, well, both proactive and also responding to whatever events happen on campus. Right. Um, so as far as the providers, uh, it, it's it's there's a couple of things that we're already doing. So, for example, we're working with a grant that we have through the city of Berkeley on conducting an audit of Berkeley High's mental health services. And from there, identifying who are the partners we need to link up with to address gaps in our mental health services. We have an amazing staff that's recently come on board at the health center that would love an opportunity to go into the classes to do more presentations. We also are building out our contracts um, with our consent ed, which is absolutely critical. And so finding a time to do that uh, in flex. Um, but then also uh, I wanna work individually with teachers, with departments, with SLCs. So for example, when I speak to the multilingual department, 
and, and, uh, and one of our amazing teachers, Daniela Maze, she knows of organizations that can come in and help English newcomers. And so I wanna see how I can partner so that she can come in and, and, and maybe address her students in those flex, right? So uh, there's a lot of work to do. I, I, the summer is an opportunity to rest and it's also an opportunity to get a lot of work done. Um, and that's the work that we'll be doing. And as far as affinity groups, I mean, yeah, we have about 48 hours left in the school year, um, but we're gonna find a way to at least initiate the surveys um, and then think of how to host um, some groups so that we get some input, right? So it's not just what comes out in a spreadsheet. And then for SPED, I think my other question was around SPED in particular. Are we engaging, you know, the parents of children with disabilities and is 100 minutes too long? Yeah, so it's, it's absolutely something we're going to do. Uh, I've been intentional about talking to our SPED staff on campus. Uh, so, for example, supervisors who work with a lot of instructional aides who are working with students that have the most needs and getting feedback from them. And so one of the things that you don't see in the presentation today is some of the other models that we considered, right? And for some of the other models, uh, there were some serious concerns raised about how students with IEP would go through those models. Again, when you have four to five weeks of gaps in between classes. Uh, and so those conversations are going and we're absolutely gonna bring the parents in. Okay, Director Brown, uh, Vice President Brown. Uh, thanks, President Albert. Thank you all so much for um, your presentation and for being here um, this evening. I have a couple of questions and so I'll give them all to you at one time and if I need to repeat them, I'm totally fine to do that. Um, first, let me just say that I absolutely love the idea of the flex period, um, especially as it seeks to address the social emotional needs of students, they return back um, to campus. I did wanna ask a question because I've had the opportunity um, to do some research school on, um, on responsive advisories and found that the majority of them um, are most effective when advisory either begins in the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. Um, could you talk for a second about um, your decision around placement of that flex time throughout the school day? And that's question number one. Question number two um, is, regard, is in regard to um, teaching and learning. And I want to know um, what teaching and learning models or practices um, will be either adapted or adopted um, in response to the additional, additional instructional minutes um, during the day. And then finally, um, thank you to Ms. Lopez for um, meeting with the students and, and capturing the student voice. I thought that was really important. Um, however, the proposed bell schedule doesn't capture their advocacy around um, a longer lunch period. And so I was wondering if that was um, something you all could address as well. Um, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I'm actually secondary to this fishbowl. Um, Mr. Porik is the one that put it together and I came in as support. Um, so uh, we owe her a lot of gratitude for that hard work because, you know, pulling students at this very um, busy time of the year was not was not as easy. And I just- Forgive me, thank you, Ms. Tafork, for your work here. And um, um, I don't know that I have answers about the flex period, but one, one thing I can tell you about flex period at uh, um, the placement, uh, the students themselves were really honest in, in saying that having flex in the earlier part of the day would be better uh, because having it at the end of the day, it just seems like, um, it would be sort of not wasted time, but uh, not as, as um, productive for them. So um, I know that uh, um, Principal Regosa is looking at uh, models of where it would be best. Um, and I don't know, Amanda, um, anything else that you're thinking about as far as the placement of Flex or um, any of the other questions? Yeah, I mean, we uh, the model we showed to students actually had flex last period that is the, the first model we built out and their feedback was we're not going to care about it if you put it last period um like Susie said they were really honest and they suggested that it be a break in the day so that they could like catch up from first period or whatever period it is and then go into the afternoon feeling less stressed it was actually also a theme in a lot of the staff feedback was that they wanted it embedded in the day so that um 
like students would feel its value and it would feel like a, a quality time with students. Um, personally, I really like it right after first period because you've got those kids who are 10 minutes late to first period and you can say, hey, stick around for an extra five, 10 minutes um, and, and I can get you caught up. Whereas if they're running to another class, then you know you've got that ripple effect of then they're late to every class that day because every teacher is holding them an extra five, 10 minutes. So you can tell their flex teacher, I'm catching up with this kid. Um, so that's just a bit on the anecdotal side of um, placement. In terms of lunch and Rego, so you can speak more to this. Um, the in terms of compliance, we like we would have to add more minutes to the day if we made lunch longer. So the kind of thing we've been able to add is actually a ten minute pe passing period after lunch instead of just a six minute passing period. So it is a little bit longer. Um, we've been playing around with some other models, Rego. So I don't know if you want to get into that. Um, yeah, so I mean, lunches, you know, we have an open campus uh, at BHS and overwhelming majority of our students exit the gates and, and go off to lunch. And one of the things we're having to think about is what is August going to look like, right? If you go into any of the restaurants in downtown right now, they have their social social distance markers. Normally on a regular school day, when you go into a restaurant, there's 30 kids packed ready to order. I don't know if that's going to fly with, with the restaurants, right? And so we need to be thoughtful about how, you know, we either do staggered lunches, uh, which of course has implications on nutritional services, um, right? So it's those are outstanding questions that we have. Um, but but we we are being thoughtful about advisor. Sorry about flex. Um, we want it to be meaningful. And so one of the things that we also thought about is if we put flex at the end of the day, we know a lot of our students participate in athletics, and they often have to leave early. And we didn't want then flex to just be an afterthought, right? Oh, I get to leave early. I'm not going to miss anything. Um, also, you know, until we really systematically address the tardy issue in the morning, we also don't want flex to just be placed in the morning so that, well, kids are arriving late, so they're not going to miss one of their core classes. We want to give it the value that we think it deserves. As far as the instructional modes um, that you mentioned, so there's a couple of things that, that we're really thinking about for next year. We've started a couple of years ago, universal design for learning. Um, and so we want kids getting up. We want kids moving around. And sometimes those less than 60 minutes really feel rushed. We have to deliver content, do some practice, show some mastery, move. You got to go to the next class, right? But if we have some longer time, we can do modeling. We can use audio and visual. Uh, we can get kids up um, and, and we can do more group projects, right? Um, the second thing we're, we're, we're really thinking about, um, why is this absolutely skipping my mind? Um, Project-based learning, right? So, um, a lot of our, so for example, I think Toporic and Arts and Humanities, they do a lot of interdisciplinary work, right? Where kids are, are going back and forth between their classes and working on a history and English project, on a science and math project. Um, in, in hopefully the not too distant future when we can think of traffic flow going back to normal, we also envision flex as being flexible that even if you're assigned with one teacher, um, you know, if you're struggling on something or you have a test coming up, then maybe there can be a little bit of sharing, right? You really need help with this subject. This is the teacher you're gonna work with. Again, we need to get to a place where we can have that traffic flow without you know, having so many strict safety protocols in place. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to go to Director Sinai and, and um, just remind everybody that we have um, a lot more to get to tonight. Um, Director Sinai. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for the presentation. And um, I have a, one clarifying question and then I have a comment. So, cause I think there's a, a, a lot of the questions I was gonna ask were asked. Um, the flex period is required, right? That's not an option for students. Okay, that, I just wanted to be clear on that. So I guess um, don't interpret, please don't interpret my comments as discouragement um, because I actually, really value um, jumping on an opportunity and, uh, for change where I think this is one where we're looking at students coming back and how can they come back. Um, at the same time, um, I really wanna honor what student director Miller has said in the sense of rushing um, into something when we've got you know a hundred and, how many teachers do we have at Berkeley High? Um, you know, who have to adjust their instructional practice, who need to be trained in how to convert from the 40, 50, 40, 50 minute class 
to a hundred minute. I, I love the, I mean, my son was at Berkeley High when they talked about block scheduling last time um, and putting in advisory periods last time. And there, there's a lot of, of resistance to block scheduling. There is a lot of research that says block scheduling is a good way to go. But I feel like we need to do that research. We need to align it with what the educational out, like Director Babbitt said, what are the educational outcomes? But I fear rushing into something is a recipe for failure. And at Berkeley High, we try a lot of things and we're an innovative, we're an innovative campus. Um, but at the same time, if you jump into something without enough preparation, it, it can blow up. And I would, I would actually like us to pursue the block schedule. I really like the flex period. I'd like to figure out how to do that because everybody is talking about the social emotional support that all of our students need, not just some students, but all of our students. So I really value that. But I fear moving too quickly in a summer where we can't get teachers to teach summer school because they need a break. To think that you're going to have this summer to develop your new whole new curriculum of how you're going to teach in the next year um, makes me feel like we're not going to enter the school year and we're not going to enter this 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 change in in a thoughtful enough and and prepared enough way. So um, I'd like to continue. I'd like to encourage the continuation of the planning around it. It took what, two and a half years to plan U9. And that was just one grade level. And it was really thorough and it was really thought out and it was well prepared. I would like us to, I, I'm not saying you need to use two or three years, but at least more than two months. I mean, I, I think two months is too fast to pivot on this, but I think, um, you know, having the decision to go this direction for maybe 22, 23, would be a great idea. So, I, you know, I'm excited about it, but I'm very wary of rushing into it. Thank you, Director Sinai. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna let Director Miller have the last word after I make a quick comment myself, which is somewhat along the lines of what you said, Director Sinai. I mean, I, I guess I, I view, I, I don't, you know, we're not, we're not the experts. You all are the experts. Um, you know, we don't, some of us know the, some of the research, you know, better than others, but, but you all are the ones who are the education professionals. And I feel like our job as a board, and this is this item is here for discussion, is not, not to direct, you know, how Bell schedule is done, but to ensure that the that the process for a decision like this um, comports with board policies and our values, which is you know, research-based and inclusive um, and thoughtful. Um, and um, and so and this has been very thoughtful. And as you said, Principal Rigo, so it's been it's been you know very rushed, and you're trying to take advantage of of an opportunity, like Director Sinai said. Um, you know, I share some of the concerns about the rush nature of it. Um, and um, you know, I hope you take and I hope you take these thoughts and comments to heart, and in the spirit that they're being offered, which is you know really supportive of the um, of of the impetus to to engage in a really thoughtful. Um, redesign of the bell schedule um, for a school is you know that that hasn't been redesigned in that way as you've said a number of times since 1920. Um, so that this isn't a vote of the board, but but it, but you're hearing some caution, I think, um, and some wariness about the time frame. Um, Director Miller, I'll turn over to you. Yeah, I mean, Director Sinai, President Alpers said some of the exact things that I was going to say. We spent two years on U9. This does, I mean. I don't know. I just, I really like where this is going. And I, I mean, I had block schedule in middle school and it was great. It was really productive, but this just isn't enough time. And I think to really get a good sample size of some of the 3000 students that go to Berkeley high school, this summer is not the time to do it. We're just coming off an extremely difficult year. Same reason for why it might not be the best for a lot of teachers to have to rework their curriculum. It's the same for students. We just came off this incredibly traumatizing year. And I think throwing us into a bunch of different live events and different groups and a lot of different discussions like it's just this I just don't I really don't believe this is the time to do this and there are a lot of students who agree with me who I who messaged me about this saying they agree with me on that and I think um 
So that's where I want to leave with that because I think um, Director Sinai and President Alfred said a lot of what I was going to say too, but I also want to say um, there was something said about making sure that fle a flex period was not missed for students who have after school activities such as sports. And I don't know how I feel about that mindset, honestly. I think if a student has to miss part of school, it should not be the instructional minutes. I think, you know, the extra support period that we have, it, we need that. We really do. And we, and we need it for a reason. But when it comes to a student missing their instructional minutes from a real, from like a class versus their flex period, I just, I don't know how to balance that personally. And I think that's another question that we need to think about going into this, which is why I don't necessarily think this can be all wrapped around this summer to fully put into next year. So again, I, I'm not, I'm not saying not ever. I really believe in this kind of schedule, but I just don't think now is the right time for it. Um, all right. Well, I, I, you know, you've heard our thoughts and questions and comments and concerns. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave it. Um, we'll, we'll give it back to you now. Um, to take to take that um, take that all into consideration. Again, this is not a, we're not taking action. We're not voting or directing anything, but we're providing you our, our you're, we're a sounding board for you tonight. Um, and we really appreciate all three of you being here. It's it means a lot to us to have some time with you, and we're grateful for all your work and and um, uh, on this and in, and in general at the high school. So thank you. Yes, and um, I'll jump in to offer my thanks as well. Really appreciate your time, and Miss Weber, thank you as well for being here with us this night. Um, okay, we're going to, um, because we have some um, guests with us tonight, we're going to um, jump to a, to a brief, um, no more than a total of 20 minute presentation um, on, an, on another exciting initiative in the district, which is um, educator housing. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Director Kalise, um, and we have a total of 20 minutes for this, including questions. Understood. Thank you, President Alper. Um, I have some of our folks here tonight from Saha and uh, Abode Communities. Uh, as the board may remember, um, <clears throat> Saha and Abode will be our partners for our workforce housing initiative and project. And at the board's request, we're bringing them here just to sort of introduce them. And they'll, sort of, they'll do a very short presentation on who they are and how they plan on engaging the community and some next steps forward. Uh, we had talked prior to the meeting uh, about a week or two ago, we plan on trying to limit the presentation to about 10 to 12 minutes and then opening up for some questions. So with that, I will pass it over and I'll ask them to introduce themselves briefly. Uh, Susan, we can start with you followed by Robin and the rest of your team. You're muted, Susan. I am. Uh, well, good evening. We are delighted to be here tonight to talk to you a little bit about the team um, that's been selected to work in partnership with Berkeley Unified School District to fulfill a long held dream of being able to create affordable housing uh, for educators and staff in the community. Um, we have a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna call that up. Great. So we'll keep it brief. I know you have a long night, a lot of important things to talk about. Um, we are going to mostly talk about our team and what we bring to this project and process. Um, and I think we have a little time for questions. Um, but here we are tonight to talk to you about this project. Next slide, please. Um, today's presenter include myself, Robin Hughes, and Laura Regis. We represent a really amazing joint venture of two seasoned nonprofit affordable housing developers. Um, also on our team, but not here tonight, are our architects and general contractors, also super experienced local um, East Bay based uh, design and construction team. So a little bit about me um, and our team. So collectively, this group um, has been working over many decades, uh, nonprofit affordable housing development, combined 100 years of experience. Um, we really pride ourselves in the whole process of the, the project from the really initial planning phases and community input to assembling all the competitive financing, bringing together a talented design team, uh, working through construction, and in the end, delivering a housing product, affordable housing community um, that's in alignment with the goals and dreams and hopes of the partners that we work with. Um, we bring a lot of local expertise with Deep Roots in Berkeley that I'll talk a little bit more about. And we also bring school district experience with other educator housing projects um, that our abode communities partners will talk about. And finally, we are in this 
um, for the long term. We're developers, we also own, operate, and support our properties. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. Um, so Satellite Affordable Housing Associates, of which I'm the CEO, is a Berkeley-based nonprofit, mission-based organization. Um, we've been operating in this community for over 50 years. Uh, throughout the Bay Area, we've developed 70 properties in Berkeley alone. We have over 25. Um, some of them you may have seen in your wander wandering around Berkeley, um, including Harper Crossing, which was re a senior project, which was recently completed near Ashby Bart, um, Helios Corner, which is on um, the corner of uh, uh, University and Sacramento near North Berkeley Bart, um, and many others. You may see that we're un under construction right now with All Souls Episcopal Church in North Berkeley on Oxford Street, um, and we're in construction um, building affordable senior housing there. So hopefully you've seen us around town. Um, we serve several thousand residents, um, and we have a really robust pipeline of future projects, um, including uh, housing for seniors, families, veterans, people who are formerly homeless, youth aging out of foster care, um, and a wide assortment of all, all with the same shared lack of affordable housing. And that's what our mission is, is to provide those opportunities for our community members that have really been left out of the hot real estate market that, that we live in in the Bay Area. Um, for myself, I've been the executive director um, here for 16 years. I moved here from New York City when my son was just a baby and he's graduating from Albany High next Friday. Uh, so it's been a long journey for me here in the East Bay and um, I've been committed to affordable housing my whole career. It's just what I, what I do and what I love. And I'm really, really delighted to be part of the team um, that's been recommended to be chosen to work on this project together. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, uh, Robin, the CEO of Abode Communities to talk about their experience. Thank you, Susan. And I wanna thank the board for having us here tonight to talk a little bit about our team and our, our experience in doing affordable housing. As Susan said, my name is Robin Hughes. I'm the president and CEO of Abode Communities. I've had the pleasure of uh, leading this organization for the past 25 years. I've spent my career in uh, the, the nonprofit and, and public sector uh, and housing, community development and economic development. Uh, Abode Communities was formed in the, um, the late 1960s uh, during the civil rights movement as a place where uh, architects could engage in the civil rights movement through the built environment. And we continue that legacy as we uh, produce affordable housing uh, and uh, locations throughout the state of California. We're based in Los Angeles. The past three years uh, have began to develop our portfolio up in the, in the uh, Bay Area, including Alameda County. And we are very excited to bring our experience in uh, school district housing in partnership with Saha to deliver this great project with the school district. So we have over uh, 40 properties serving uh, over 7,000 residents. And again, a robust pipeline, including three projects um, in the Bay Area, one of which um, Laura will talk about is a school district project that we're doing in, in Palo Alto. Um, I will talk a little more uh, later on, but I think the things that set about communities apart is our collaborative work with uh, government agencies, including school district, and our um, willingness to really sit and, and listen to what your goals and objectives are and delivering on those. So we really look forward to working with the Berkeley team. So Laura, Laura Regas to talk more about our school district experience. Thanks Robin and good evening everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you all. And we're, as you can tell, we're all really excited about this project and to be working with you. Um, I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to share with you some highlights of these other uh, projects that we have worked on uh, over the last 10, 13 years with uh, a couple of different school districts and public partners. Uh, the first of these 
joint development opportunities with, with the Los Angeles Unified School District um, in the late 2000s called Rio Vista Apartments. And this was the first ever affordable housing development built on school district owned land. And it used typical affordable housing financing, but also some bond funding from the district. And our strong working relationship with the district was really forged on this project where we worked closely with their staff to pursue their goals um, as well as kind of navigate the complexities of marrying the constraints in the education code with the, all the funding requirements that we have to deal with that come from the internal revenue code, which guides low income housing tax credit program. Um, this is a project that was built on a vacant lot that had been used for parking for staff who worked just up the block on a vacant, excuse me, at a local elementary school. And so as part of the redevelopment process, we actually provided that replacement parking for that, those staff members. Um, the site ended up being divided so the district could concurrently build a new early education center um, immediately adjacent to our 50 unit housing development and the shared parking. So it was really a lovely outcome for the community. Uh, uh, so many wonderful new uses. Other goals that the district had at that time were um, finding some shared community space uh, that teaching staff could use to hold special meetings as well as creating an arrangement for uh, children living in the housing development to use the outdoor play yard at the early education center after hours. So a, a lot of nice outcomes there. Just a and quick then, time check that we have, we have 10 minutes left for this. Got it. <clears throat> um, the success of that project led to another opportunity with LAUSD to create some of community housing, which uh, evolved uh, and took on another, um, another layer, which created uh, a leasing preference for school uh, district staff. And we worked really closely with the district to again, provide um, new parking opportunities for their staff, but um, we're really proud of the way that we closely worked with the district to um, kind of market this opportunity and quickly lease up the units dedicated for their staff. Um, and finally, our most recent uh, school district opportunity is what Robin mentioned. It's called 231 Grant here up here in Palo Alto in the Bay Area. This is a partnership with the County of Santa Clara who owns the land in downtown Palo Alto and will provide um, new housing opportunities for teaching and district staff across a number of districts in Santa Clara County and in San Mateo. Um, you know, the, the, the public partners here have a number of goals, but we found that over time as we've been working closely that, um, you know, they've really uh, eliminated kind of some of the other goals they started with, which included office space and some other retail space, and they really decided to focus in on housing. So we have had the opportunity to work with them to even refine the design and get more housing units than when we started with. Um, so that's just a really summary of um, the partnerships that we are excited to create um, and build on to, to really pursue the goals of our district, di excuse me, different district partners. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so kind of building on that, um, taking a thoughtful approach to the pre-development phase on new project is really important to us. And, you know, a key component of that is the community engagement process. And while we may start with a conceptual project idea and a design, we know it will evolve as we learn more about the needs and the desires of various stakeholders. And we try to create opportunities for these conversations to be done in different formats that are comfortable and not intimidating. And we're really looking forward to the opportunity to do these meetings in person with you all and all the uh, stakeholders, um, although we do have the ability to facilitate them over Zoom. It's just a lot more fun and interesting to do them in person. And while the design is often a focal point of these conversations, we often find that they're really meaningful um, conversations that take place around service programming, on-site amenities, unit sizes, public transportation patterns, you know, other non-residential needs. So um, there's a lot of interesting material to cover and we're really excited about um, kind of moving into this next phase in the near future with you all. Let's go to the next slide. And so one final word kind of on design that kind of ties into all of, the, all of that around community engagement. Um, you know, we wanna encourage you to visit our websites and see the quality of the work that we've done in our various housing developments. We have a great design firm on board with Paya Talk as our architect and a team that really cares about producing something that we will all be proud of. Um, you know, we value high quality, durability, energy efficiency, sustainability, and then we balance all of that with financial feasibility and we take all of those values really seriously. So a lot of lofty goals that we, um, we, we really uh, prioritize and um, we don't wanna leave any of them behind. So I'm gonna hand it over to Robin who will kind of wrap up sharing with you our experience on securing the financing to get to the finish line and some other closing thoughts.
Thanks, Laura. And I'm sorry if my internet is, is uh, low, but you know, one, one of the key things that we bring as a partnership is our ability to go out and leverage other financing uh, with the district owned land that we will be utilizing to develop the housing. So our team has extensive experience in working in these public private partnerships and going out and securing these competitive sources of public subsidies uh, to make our affordable housing work and our workforce housing work. So we are active players in secured allocations of tax credits and bond uh, to build our affordable housing. We have extensive experience in utilizing ground leases as a way of structuring our financing and working with our lenders investors to um, make sure we meet all of your uh, ed code issues as Lara placed out as well as working within our housing finance system. And uh, both of our organizations have extensive experience in working with state funding all of the competitive resources out there. And we also work very closely with um, our local cities and counties to secure funding. In particular, Saha has worked with the city of Berkeley with their Measure O funds on several of their projects within Berkeley. So this is one of the things that our team does really well is bring together um, an array of financing uh, to build our affordable housing and to deliver the affordability level um, that we're looking to serve uh, with, in this case, Berkeley uh, educators and, uh, and uh, school district employees. And lastly, and I'll just really just close on, on this slide, um, you know, both communities in Saha, uh, we feel like our missions align with the school district and what you're hoping to achieve with this uh, project. And we are really here to work very closely in collaboration with you. We engage, we listen, and we respond. And we know that along this journey, there will be many complex issues to address. And we're just really here to deliver on our promise and our commitment to bring uh, educating, educator and, uh, and school employee housing to the Berkeley community. So thank you again for having us tonight. And we'll open it up for questions. Great. We have four minutes for questions. I'm going to take a page of student director Miller's book and hold us to that time. Um, but that's a really great presentation. This is such an exciting project. Um, director Sinai. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited about working with Saha and Abode. Um, I'm just going to ask, actually, my question goes to executive director Khalees in the sense of next steps. Um, and, um, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we did a lot of community outreach to let folks know that you were presenting tonight. So I'm hoping we can also do an introduction to the community of the team um, and just trying to figure out, like Dr. Executive Director Cleese, in relation to next steps, um, are we entering into, you know, like a preliminary, like first stage contract with some, could you just tell us like kind of where we are? because. I'd like to figure out when we can start talking, you know, when we can introduce you to the community, because in addition to our labor partners in the district, they're also key stakeholders. No, that's a great question. So we've got a few things happening right now, Director Sinai. Uh, I'm working with Saha and Abode right now on a red line of the ground lease and an agreement for the services. So that's something that we're working on that's going back and forth. Concurrently, uh, Saha and Abode is working on the application for the city of Berkeley for Measure O funding. And we've also been working, trying to coordinate a lot of people's schedules to include Saha, Abode, my own, Dr. Stevens, to actually schedule an initial listening session, uh, at least at the adult school for adult school staff, and then also for community, as they're the ones who will be uh, impacted the most. I think we're gonna start seeing a lot of community engagement uh, with the turn of the new school year. Uh, so I would say later this year, I think is really when that would kick off. Although that timeline hasn't been delineated yet, that's something that we're still working on internally uh, with, our, with our developer partners here. So Dr. Stevens and, and um, oh, he's up there, um, and Executive Director Police, I'd like to talk about bringing together our committee because I think we need to, you know, include that there's uh, buy-in from the get-go. And we have a committee that includes our labor partners and a couple of our community partners. Um, and I know that might morph into, you know, our, you know, our site committee or whatever, but right now, 
I think we need to talk about how we re-engage, especially as we're about to lose people for the summer. Um, I'd like to make sure that our labor partners, that we've got some, some touch point. Okay. Before everybody starts off. Great, thank okay. you. Director Bassett, do you have a very quick question because we have one minute left. Yes, just really quick. Um, I echo what Director Sinai said about the need for community engagement and meeting with the committee as soon as possible, especially in Berkeley. My question um, for Saha and Abote is, you know, Berkeley has a lot of different transportation related policies, like we're trying to reduce parking, there's lots of, you know, a lot, big push towards TDM. Are, have you worked in cities with um, kind of comparable vision zero oriented, very TDM focused policies as part of your design? And what's been your experience with that? So I want to take that and offer a brief response. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go really quick. Maybe Laura, Laura, you want to jump in. Every community is different, but there is definitely throughout the Bay Area, many communities we've worked on that are really gearing towards minimizing parking. And it's pretty interesting, but parking ratios are, are such a huge driver of what ultimately you can build in terms of affordable housing. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. Um, and we've worked with such a wide range of community parking parameters. Um, and of course, we love less parking, um, but we also have to really make sure we meet demand. And um, But planning around efficient parking and promoting use of public transportation is definitely um, a key goal for all the members of the development team. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. And we appreciate you, your patience with us um, and being here late at night. Um, and we're excited to work with you in the coming years. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank um, you very much. Have a good night, everybody. All right, you too. Good okay. Um, now, thank, thank you, you all. Um, now we'll move to item and to the the um, discussion item about the LCAP, the local control and accountability plan, and the budget update. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Stevens. Great, thank you again, President Elper. Um, I'm joined this evening by Assistant Superintendent Pauline Follinsby, who is, um, our, serves as our Chief Business Officer. Um, listening in this evening is also our Director of um, State, Federal, and Special Projects, Michelle Sinclair. Um, Michelle won't be presenting this evening, but has really played a key role in the development of a lot of, uh, a lot of the content that we'll share this evening. So special thanks to, to her and acknowledgement for her hard work. Um, what we hope to do in this presentation is um, pull together successfully, we hope, an awful lot of information about the developing LCAP draft. LCAP stands for the Local Control Accountability Plan, uh, and integrate the sort of developing goals and actions into a presentation on the budget. Um, so in the next two meetings on June 9th and June 23rd, uh, we will be bringing for first reading uh, both the LCAP plan and the budget. Uh, and then for final approval of both of those documents on June 23rd. All of this is meant as a preview. It's meant to solicit board discussion, give you a sense of our progress towards our overall goals. Um, I will, as a sort of a special note, um, sort of just mark how complicated this particular budget year has been um, with the development of a three-year LCAP plan, uh, lots of interrelated budgets, as is always the case, um, and then the existence of new um, COVID funding um, has sort of made for a particularly complex uh, budget season. Um, what I would note as well is that we are making good progress towards identifying revenue sources for lots of our shared priorities um, and still have some work in front of us. And we hope that this presentation delineates what we've already accomplished through, current, through decisions uh, and then the decisions that lie in front of us. A very quick reminder about our timeline, uh, that we are now far to the right on this timeline. We're now in the month of June and just working on finishing up our LCAP after a great deal of committee and community engagement. So we'll work through uh, these contents this evening. We'll just do a quick review of our uh, board priorities as they were articulated back in January of this year. A quick summary of parent community and educator feedback that we've received. A very graphical um, sort of representation of the current draft of our LCAP goals and actions, and then work you through a number of the budget, sort of our revenue sources and how we're doing in building all those budgets. So let's first um, sort of back up the calendar, take a look at the way the board articulated high level priorities for this budget building season. Uh, this is the list dated February 7th, 2021. Um, first, um, the board articulated a desire to see student support built into our budgets, both ongoing and one time. 
um, articulated the desire to see the Black Lives Matter resolution continue to be funded, support for Latinx students, family engagement, gender equity, and our business enterprise system upgrade, uh, as well as support for early literacy for transgender students and ethnic studies, um, work with our labor partners to secure new contracts for the coming school year, mathematics, and communications. Um, we took those priorities into a series um, of forums where we solicited feedback. We've been working over the course of many months now to solicit um, uh, input from parents and guardians from the broader community, a uh, set of advisory committees, uh, as well as our educators. This is a quick listing of all of those various um, feedback sessions that we've had, including our formally designated committees, um, work with other constituent groups, and then community engagement opportunities. Uh, I won't read this entire slide, but represented here um, is sort of broken down by goal feedback we've received across a variety of these forums. Um, uh, you can see, for example, under goal one, which generally relates to high quality classroom instruction, the kinds of concerns that have been surfacing in all of our surveying and our one to one interaction. Um, you can see as well for goal two, related to intervention, goal three, safe, wel welcoming and inclusive school environment, uh, and then goal four um, is about program evaluation and the use of metrics. So again, I won't read this. This is just pulling a lot of our LCAP information into a single slide. Um, I should note for members of the public um, that our draft LCAP is attached to tonight's agenda item. So for folks who would like to see the full 67 page document that is our developing LCAP plan, uh, please know that that's included. This is not yet final, it's in development, but lots of the information I'm pulling forward in these slides comes directly from that more lengthy plan. So let's jump now into an overview of the draft LCAP goals and actions. And what we hope we've been able to do is represent in these coming slides sort of a graphic look at the differences that are now emerging in this coming LCAP. So very significant going back to several board meetings, uh, we proposed a modification to the goals in this LCAP. Uh, listed on the left hand side of this slide are the goals from the last three year LCAP. Uh, and then on the right hand slide, the goals for this year's um, three year LCAP. Most significantly is the separation of uh, uh, the goals related to uh, high quality classroom instruction and then in goal two, high quality intervention services. We did that very deliberately to be able to delineate with more clarity in our plan where we're intending to impact all classrooms. Uh, and then uh, uh, goal two, where we're intending to impact instructional, uh, sorry, intervention services for our students. So now in these four slides, uh, we get a representation of the developing goals and actions in our LCAP. Uh, again, this is just a very uh, sort of cursory summary of the 67 page document that's linked into this, you know, this evening's board agenda. Um, so items uh, shaded in pink represent um, new work captured in this coming draft LCAP. Uh, items in gray represent uh, those that are carried over from the past three year plan. So you can see just as an example here in group one as it relates to or goal one as it relates to high quality classroom instruction, um, work on a literacy action plan that includes the selection of a new universal screener, um, uh, pro work on progress and monitoring and interventions and dyslexia awareness professional development for our teachers, all part of a coming plan. Uh, included just in summary form here are action items from the Black Lives Matter resolution um, and what I assume will be the soon to be approved Latinx resolution for this evening. Uh, and then moving over to other pink goals, we have math coaches and as well a, a grade nine math coach included in this draft plan. Uh, and that I should note is also sort of lifted from a developing draft of the African American success framework. Um, just as sort of quick primer on this, we've been working for um, several months um, with a partner to develop an African American success framework. And so we're working to take elements of that framework and build it into our LCAP plan and ensure that it's funded for the coming school year. So also included cultural competence training and the revision of the EL master plan. So I'm going to skim through the next several slides to just give members of the public and the board a sense of the developing LCAP goals and actions. Again, pink is new. Gray is um, ongoing. I'll continue to move relatively quickly in the interest of time. Here's a representation of new items being built into um, the safe, welcoming, and inclusive climate goal. 
This includes work on OFI, which has been a topic of conversations here at the board level and in community meetings, uh, as well as um, um, uh, sort of upgrades to our Office of Civil Rights and Compliance in terms of the training and education opportunities they offer, um, ex potentially expanded support for Bridge uh, and the Puente program as well as listed here. Uh, and then finally, uh, goals as they relate to program evaluation and the use of metrics. Again, highlighting elements that are new in the plan um, that includes um, uh, sort of insertions of additional staff into the BREA team. So we're now going to move over to, from the LCAP goals and actions to talk specifically about budgets. Um, we have accomplished a great deal already in terms of budgeting for the coming school year. So over on the left-hand side of this particular table is a listing of the budgets that have come before the board, um, where we've been trying to take revenue sources and use the board's high priority list um, to be able to create action items. So among those budgets that have been passed last night, the expanded learning opportunities budget, um, we've identified reductions from the supplemental grant, we've passed all of our BCEP and BARA budgets, have made our Title I allocations to our schools and are concluding um, collective bargaining, at least with our teachers unions so far. We do still have in front of us though, a number of important decisions that relate to the general fund and some COVID funding. Um, they include being sure that we find revenue sources for expiring or reduced funding. Um, and what I mean by that is that we find locations for all of our current supplemental grant expenses, as well as an expiring low performing student block grant. Uh, that we have deliberations in front of us about OFI, about ESCAPE, that new enterprise system, about BRIDGE, special education, and HR. And I sort of highlight these now because you'll see how they show up in just a few slides. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Pauline Follinsby. She's going to walk us through the next detailed set of budget slides to give the board a sense of what we've accomplished by way of budgeting and what's still in front of us for the month of June. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, so I'll be walking you through um, our budget um, just in terms, um, this is just a graphical representation of the district's budget, $171 million. And this represents our various sources of funding. Um, we have our BCEP as mentioned earlier, our BARA, and our federal, state, and local funding. And of course, our LCFF funding which is um, our unrestricted general fund, as well as funding for our LCAP. Um, oh, oh, so on the next slide, um, as mentioned earlier, we have already accomplished, um, um, we've brought several, several proposals to the board, including our ELO and some COVID funding. Um, and of course, rep our reductions to the, to the supplemental grant, as well as BCEP, Bearer, Title One, and bargaining. So this is a, a repeat of what was mentioned earlier. So on the next slide, and as a reminder, um, we're we're trying to find a home for about a million dollars in our supplemental budget be, due to the reduction in our unduplicated student count. And this actually um, is how our supplemental budget gets funded, and the decline in our unduplicated pupil count is impacting the funding for the for these programs and as a result we're um, we're trying to reduce our LCAP expenditure to balance that budget. So on the next slide. And um, this this is just um, a reminder of what has already been approved by the board and what um, has been transferred out of the supplemental budget and that has now been that's now being paid for by other funding sources. So I'm not going to read this entire list. Um, but suffice to say there's $813,000 um, of about $940, $40,000 that have actually been picked up by other funding sources, including BCEPs, high quality um, instruction and classroom support, BCEP student achievement, we eliminated one position um, as well as transferring costs to the African American of the African American Success Manager to the general fund, as well as um, shifting some costs to our COVID and our ELO funds. So on the next slide. Also, we have looked at um, our BCEP and bearer expenses. These have also come to you in various forms, and that's about $740,000 of 
of expenses, and these are various asks in the BSEP and Barrow program, and they are considered new expenses. Um, so this is a pretty exhaustive list covering our music program, BSEP's music program, instructional technicians, um, the oversight, BSEP and Barrow, as well as the recruitment and retention. So next slide. And again, um, this is just a recap of what we've brought to the board um, on April 24th and again on May 5th, we've brought about $3.2 million um, of, of projects to be funded by COVID, um, including our restorative research school grants, the pilot seven day program for Longfellow, um, the data integ integration specialist in Braille, our technology asks, special education for summer assessment, as well as our graduation costs. So this is a significant um, expenditure as well that we have already accomplished in terms of building next year's budget and these have already been board approved. So on the next slide. So now that brings us to our, oh no, this is also um, what has been, <laughs> what has already um, been, um, uh, um, approved, if you will. We have settled with our teachers union as mentioned um, in board comments. And, um, and this is the actual total cost of our bargaining. So our bargaining, um, our compensation, we settled on a 1% ongoing and a three and a half percent bonus as well as several, um, several changes to the early childhood education um, ongoing compensation, as well as adding steps to their program. Those two items are gonna be funded by um, the Child Development Program Fund 12. They're able to absorb those costs within their project. Um, we've also um, negotiated changes to the early teaching rate, um, health insurance, um, stipends, um, one-time payments um, for BCCE that has to be determined. And then we also have one time um, a relief from the general fund. We're reducing school service assistants and new supervisions, supervisors in the, in the general fund budget. And we're um, asking for that to be funded by one, for one more year using COVID funds. So that subtotal um, our negotiations, 1.3 million ongoing, 175 one time, and 200,000 ongoing from other funding sources, as well as one-time COVID funds of $4.6 million. So, um, so on the next slide, um, so this is gonna, we're now gonna look at, a, at our new um, June investments, our asks for June um, to be funded from the general fund and COVID funds. So um, as mentioned earlier, um, this is going to be asking for funding to, um, to support the, expa the expiring supplemental grant, our OFI program, our ESCAPE, our enterprise system, our bridge program, as well as, well as our special education and HR staffing position. So on the next slide, this, this, we'll look at this in more detail, just in terms of new investments or June investments. So for our OFI um, positions, we're looking, we're asking for three positions um, that we're now thinking will be funded by the general fund as an ongoing expense. There's the OFI director. There's also the OFI um, language liaison, Spanish speaking, as well as a family liaison. So that's three FTE um, for the OFI program. Our escape program, we're proposing um, a combination of one-time and ongoing funding from the general fund and other funding um, with the costs being um, spread out um, for um, actually picking up $176,000 using Fund 20 as well. And then this, um, this unfunded items from the supplemental budget, this is just a summary. Um, the 163 is the African American Success Manager. The $460,000 we have a listing below that um, that details what these asks are for. Um, on the next slide, thank you. Um, so we also are, are asking for one FTE for ongoing special education 
staffing, that number was a lot higher, but we found um, vacant positions that were unfilled that we're using to fit, to replace some of, to fill some of the asks for that program. A BTA counselor and a BTA administrator. This is, these are programs that, these are positions that were previously funded by BCEP and LCAP. So that's now being um, transferred over to the general fund. Um, the bridge program, an additional FTE, we're proposing using one-time funding for that um, program for next year, for 21-22. And of course, our low performing block grant, which is expiring, we have another slide that details the positions, but that's $167,000. There's also a new position um, in, in HR for um, position control that we're asking to be funded, that's um, $100,000. And our communications reorg, this is the general fund share of that reorg, as well as one-time community engagement projects um, for the middle school assignment uh, for $70,000. So in all, um, a summary of our June investments, it's $1 million ongoing in the general fund, as well as 402,000 one-time. Um, and then we're asking for other funding one time of $893,000. So on the next slide. So this looks, this is the $167,000 that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see the positions that are, that were funded by the low performing block grant and that grant is expiring on June 30th. So we're proposing that we will be shift, shifting this. Um, it's actually transferred to the general fund, but we're asking for it to be funded by COVID restricted funding just for one more year. And this is the detail that I am, that was included in the slide earlier, um, the 163,000 for the African-American Success Manager to be funded by general fund ongoing. And then we have um, one-time funding for the, lit the Longfellow Literacy Coach, um, 110,000. The literacy action plan, the consulting and program evaluation, that's $250,000 and a revision of the EL master plan. So these are costs that would have been included in, in our supplemental funding, but we're asking for that to be picked up by the general fund ongoing as well as other um, funding sources. So on the next slide, um, so how will we actually propose to fund these expenses? So that um, we're looking at um, positions um, after reviewing our position control and working closely with um, Samantha um, in HR, we came up with positions um, that are valued about $745,000. This is not the HR, not the special ed positions. These were positions that were funded and unfilled, and there are various positions, um, point two here, point two there, um, and this is going to provide $745,000 ongoing funding, as well as other reductions um, in operations, including our travel and um, legal costs and other operational costs, one time $250,000 across the board, and then um, ongoing also $250,000. And this is the $240,000 um, from the, um, for the school service assistants and new supervisors that are gonna be funded by COVID for one more year. So we've looked at the pluses and we've looked at how they're gonna be funded. So we're actually um, remaining with a shortfall um, in terms of our asks. And um, overall, um, we have a shortfall of $1.5 million in the general fund and um, $87,000 in our one-time one funding for the general fund. And of, in our other funding, the $200,000 we have identified as coming from Fund 12, and then the $5.5 million is COVID funding. And this is pretty much um, what we have available in COVID funding. So the, um, the challenge would be then um, to evaluate what do we think um, we should be looking at in terms of um, additional 
costs um, that were, there are new costs actually in June. And, um, and we'll be discussing this with the board, um, just in terms of, of costs and um, priorities. And I think Brent is gonna talk about that in more detail. Oh, I'm gonna do this, <laughs> sorry. But it, why don't you, uh, before, you think, before you'll do a better do. job with these than I will. <laughs> yeah, I will. So, um, so we thought it would be a good idea to look at these, um, the impact on our multi-year projections. And these are, this is a multi-year projection that I shared at the May revise. So we already have the increased funding, um, the increased COLA and everything is, re is reflected in these revenues for 21, 22 and the out years. So um, with the revenue of one, uh, 101 million point five in 21, 22 and 99, 22, 23 and 102.6 in 22, 23, we can then take a look at our expenses where we were and what, what are we looking at after um, including the increased requests um, for June. So if we look at the next slide. Um, so on the left, I've shown um, what our multi-year projection looked like um, with the May revise. We were balanced um, with budget reductions in the cliff here, the 22-23, um, $4.5 million reductions um, with 3 million ongoing. And that created a balanced budget, a million dollars ending fund balance on designated 0.3 and 0.8. So when we're looking at um, the, our, the impact of negotiations, um, the reductions in our expenses that we've made to try and meet these expenses and the new investments that we've I've just shared with you, um, we would, we can, actually, if we actually went and, um, and incorporated these costs, we would have a, a balanced budget after deficit spending $2.2 million in 21-22. But you can see the impact that that would have in the out years in terms of budget reductions would be going from 3 million ongoing to 5.3 ongoing um, and budget reductions one time of 1.3 that went down somewhat. So, um, so the takeaway from this is if we try to do everything, we will be deficit spending significantly in the first year and we'll be forced to make additional budget reductions in the out year. And, um, and that's, that would be the final, um, that's, the, that's the impact basically. And this is a discussion that we're hoping to have with the board in terms of um, what are your thoughts in terms of new investments and the impact as it impacts our budget reductions in the out years. So on the next slide, this kind of summarizes it and I'll hand it back to Brent. Thank you very much, um, Pauline, I appreciate it. So, so um, what we hope we've been able to convey is that we've made a lot of progress over the course of many months to build uh, multiple budgets, to be able to um, find a lot of revenue sources for priorities articulated by the board and the community over the last several months. Um, uh, as we sort of reviewed some of those new investments in things like BSEP and BERA, uh, as well as the EO, ELO plan passed by the board last night, um, there is a lot of work taking place that, that sort of comports to those priorities. Um, still, because we've been listening with a lot of care, we know that there are other priorities that aren't yet funded, and those are represented in what we've been calling the June investments, these sort of final decisions um, that we have to make together. Um, Pauline was just describing that if we fund all of these June investments, about $1.4 million in investments, um, that we will be engaged in definite deficit spending, um, uh, both um, this year and then increase the amount of cutting that will be um, required next year year. Um, as staff, we're feeling like we can manage about $750,000 of these additional June investments um, out of that total list. Um, what would be helpful to us if the board feels um, capable of it this evening is to sort of hear your thinking about how to create potentially some tiers 
um, if each tier consists of about $250,000, um, sort of how we can then work between this week's meeting and next week's first reading um, to, to bring back a package of proposals to the board that sort of conforms to the discussion tonight. Um, so we recognize these discussions are difficult. Um, we're talking about a lot of things that are of high value, both to us as individuals, to the board, and to the community. Uh, and as we've tried to stretch this year's dollars to meet a whole variety of needs, um, that we're still sort of finding that the wish list is larger than our spending capacity. So we hope very much that the presentation has felt clear, gives a clear sense of what we've accomplished and what's still ahead of us. Uh, and welcome both taking questions uh, and then engaging with the board in the discussion. Um, so again, my thanks to Pauline Follinsby and then a special shout out to Michelle Sinclair as well for her, all of her work to get us to this point. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Director, uh, Dr. Stevens and um, Assistant Superintendent Follinsby and Director Sinclair is here too. Um, there she is. Um, this incredibly complicated uh, budgeting season, as you've mentioned, um, and so much work has gone into this. So really grateful. Um, uh, I have a comment I wanted to start with, but I, but um, I don't know if it might be, it's hard to, maybe we can see what people's general comments are and then it's gonna be hard to do the $250,000 buckets without seeing, seeing it all in some way up there again, um, if, that, if that's really, um, going to be helpful to you. Um, I, so I'll just make a comment, then I'll then I'll go to Director Babbitt and Director Sinai. Um, uh, and I know it's really the budget is really tight, and and paying for ongoing positions with one-time funds is um, just makes me, you know, really nervous um, because it's 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 just punting, you know, harder decisions down the road. Um, and it's really hard to cut positions. Um, and at the same time, it's hard not to spend the money that we have. And, and often what we need to spend it on is positions. There's only so much technology we can buy or, you know, one-time things that, that we need. Um, so I, I, I know you all have been wrestling with this and we have to wrestle with it too. Um, the substantive comment I was going to make was about bridge. Um, and I noticed that on the you know on the draft budget, the my understanding is that there's um, about one FTE's worth um, of bridge support that's needed to maintain the status quo in the program, which um, is in the budget now or in the proposed budget as a ninety thousand dollar one time expense, um, and I, I think is I think a number of my colleagues have expressed um, that's a program that's that's been proven to be successful, that the data supports it, um, that serves um, many of the kids that we're trying to serve better. Um, and so uh, that, that I think is probably my highest priority is, 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 is at least maintaining the status quo in that, in that um, for that program by funding that additional request. I think putting it in one-time funds um, uh, makes it, it makes it less of a priority for the board than if it was in ongoing funds compared to other things. I mean, it's all a trade-off. I mean, as you mentioned, Dr. Stevens, it's all important, good expenditures um, that serve students. Um, but it is, I think, saying something um, if it's in one-time funds versus ongoing, it's saying that we're not sure or it's telling us that next year we're, we know that we're gonna have to sort of fight and scrap and find the funds to continue that. Um, and so um, I'd like to think about maybe switching it out and putting it in ongoing funds. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say, and this is a little bit inconsistent with what I just said, I know that there's also been an ask and, and the um, PAC representative um, made this request in public comment um, to at least consider the, um, the additional request from the program staff at Bridge for um, an expansion of the program. Um, and my understanding, there's sort of a, um, long-term wish list that's probably more than we could do now, which includes a counselor um, and, and additional instructional IAs, I mean IAs. Um, but my understanding is that with just a 0.4 addition, there could be a whole other cohort added to the program. Um, and that's about $40,000 a year. Um, and what I just wanted to put on the table for us to think about um, is using, we have a million dollars in our um, LCAP reserve fund, um, which is which under our policy we can 
access when our when we're in the situation we're in now, which is that when our supplemental funding is decreasing because of a decrease in students, um, it would be doing what I just said is bad policy, which is using one-time funds for a position. But if we committed to using, for example, $160,000 of that million dollars to fund a whole co uh, four years worth of a cohort, um, if I'm thinking of that right, um, then we could say we're going to fund this additional 0.4 for four years out of the LCAP reserve fund. It wouldn't be a big percentage of that million dollar reserve. We would still maintain a lot of it, but we would be able to immediately expand. You know, one of the programs that really is, um, you know, data driven and and not and so it's not just the testimonials we've heard, but we actually have seen the data of how successful it is. Um, so I wanted to put that on the table, um, the as a discussion, and then. Um, and then, I w then the last thing I'll say is um, on the OFI, um, the Office of Family Equity Engagement Director position being backfilled by, a, by a, the supervisor position. Um, one thing that, I, that resonated me, with me that Director Sinai mentioned at the last board meeting was um, the desire to increase OFI staff, but to, but to do so at the, as much as possible at the site level. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, this wouldn't save a, a lot of ongoing funds, but if we, um, a lot of the director position description that we approved included the job responsibilities of the supervisor. And I'm wondering if we backfilled it with a staff liaison position instead of a supervisor position, if that would save us the difference. Um, and then that, that position could have, could potentially be elevated to a supervisor position as the, the expanded OFI um, vision is created, um, but that it wouldn't immediately lock us into two um, district level positions and we put more, um, to use Director Sinai's words, sort of boots on the ground in the OP office. Um, that's a modest suggestion for saving some ongoing funds. Uh, it doesn't get us to where you want to, where, fully to where you want to get, Dr. Stevens, but I wanted to put that on the table as well too. Um, I'll stop talking there and um, I'll go to you, Director Babbitt. Um, thank you so much. Um... So my issue is with the large amounts going out of our one-time fundings, which aren't meeting some of our um, directives that we gave earlier around making sure that we use some of our one-time funding funds for um, our sustainability plan. Uh, specifically, we could be using some of those funds for our, um, our reusable dishes that the um, students have been talking about and all of our sustainability advocates have been talking about. I don't really see where um, the full PAC's recommendations are actually included in here as they've recommended them. And I don't see SBAC's recommendations. Um, so when you ask us about tiers, generally we would start by understanding what were the subcommittee's tiers and priorities from SBAC, from the Parent Advisory Committee, um, and then the superintendent's tiers. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how how we're getting to to bands without having the full information of our various subcommittees also presented to us, and um, you know, with this 3.5 percent going to one-time bonuses, is that already a done deal, or is there a way we can um, think about that because that is really eating up a lot of our one-time funds. Um, I can jump in. Uh, the, the tentative agreement, I think, should be considered to be final at this point, although it's being ratified by the, the teachers union at this point. Um, we have signed a tentative agreement for that. Can you talk about the, the, um, the, the different committee priorities? And I, I can, yes. So, um, yeah, we, we've been studying the PAC recommendations, trying our best as well to try and accommodate them um, across the, the BSEP funds, across BARA in COVID, and as well as the, um, tonight's presentation. Um, we think we've got most of those things covered, although we recognize we're not going as far in some areas, for example, like OFI. Um, as the PAC has been recommending. And that's not because we disagree with the recommendations, but because we're, you know, sort of running up against the edges of what we can spend in this year. 
Uh, and in fact, you can see we've run over those edges even with this evening's presentation. Um, in terms of um, SBAC, um, we did try to conduct a vote with SBAC yesterday, ran through most of this content. Uh, we are in the process of collecting votes from SBAC members now, um, but we're not prepared by this evening to be able to present the SBAC members vote or consideration of this information that we just shared yesterday. Okay, can we go back to, um, I don't know how we, how we need to go around negotiations because it's really, you know, it's something we need to discuss, I think, again, in closed session. Can I just clarify one thing, um, Superintendent Stevens? Um, in terms of the COVID funds, there's actually no provision in the COVID funds for sustainability. We would have to transfer our costs into the COVID funds and use um, our ongoing funding for sustainability. So there's so COVID funds is actually due to COVID um, as a result of COVID, the occurrence of COVID. So we couldn't use any of the pots of money for sustainability. So I just want to clarify. Use any one-time funds that we have in other places to shift over or we don't have one. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I said. We could move expenses to make funds available, but we could not use COVID funding for sustainability. And then what about the um, RTI coaches, the portion of their uh, labor that was um, for COVID? So during distance learning, we took some of our RTI teachers and we placed them on distance learning. Can we allocate those salaries back to our COVID funds? Because that was literally COVID related additional expenditures. Um, in concept, we could. Um, this, this conversation has just recently been raised by a member of the, the PO committee. Um, you know, we've been sort of so far taking the approach that um, in the face of an emergency that we had to reassign our BSEP funded RTI teachers to be able to cover our classroom uh, needs, both in person and distance learning needs. Uh, and so we haven't proposed at this point that we would transfer that two months of salary cost over to any other funding source, um, given that sort of BSEP was there as a buffer. Um, and that under this emergency, it was actually this extra BSEP staff that permitted us to open our classrooms in the first place. That doesn't answer my question. My question is, can we transfer those funds over? Same thing goes with the LCAP supplemental plan, right? The work that they did was now general instruction. Um, and so if we're looking to transfer funds so that we can use more of our COVID funds, which is what clearly you've been saying you wanted to do, for months now, those are places where we can look. Uh, why don't um, I'm going to ask either Pauline Follinsby or Michelle Sinclair if, if they know anything about the technical rules of those particular expenses. And, and by that, uh, Director Babbitt's question about transferring the sort of two months of salary that was expended on RTI teachers who taught in the distance learning or in-person program. So um, I will approach it on the other. Um, we, we have. Can you, it's, I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, your audio just went down a little bit, Pauline. Now you're muted altogether. We've lost your audio, Pauline. I'm not sure what's happened, Pauline. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. What, Polly, we'll come, why don't we come back to you? We'll come back to that question. Oh, we could, there we could lightly hear you. Well, let me go to Director Sinai and we'll come back to you, Assistant Superintendent Tom three. Okay. Director Sinai. So I'm trying to, to figure out how to, how to ask my questions because I, I have kind of an overarching question around the LCAP. And then there's, I have clarifying questions around the budget. Um, so I'll do my overarching. Um, and I guess this is more of a comment than a question. So um, I, you know, I, I, I wished we approached the presentation of the LCAP the way we um, identified the fourth, I think it's the fourth goal in the LCAP, which is to be data driven. So nowhere in this presentation that does it summarize our goals. 
or our outcome, our indicators. And I think, you know, um, Director Sinclair and, and Dr. Reinhardt, whoever did a lot of work on coming up with some targets. So just for my own sake, and I think I sent them to board members just as a resource, I just wanted to look at what are our, all of our goals across the demographic, race and ethnicity so that I could see whether our goals were lining up. Like we've got goals around increasing ELA and math, English language arts and math. And then we've got goals around increasing graduation rates, goals around college and career indicators, reduce the percent of students with a D or F and increase the A through G rate overall. Um, or by ethnicity, uh, race and ethnicity. And what I was trying to figure out and looking at this is how big a jumps are we looking at each of our demographics and how are the strategies that we're laying out impacting these particular outcomes? And I think I would like to use that data to drive what our priorities should be versus just what do I think is a good thing to do is what is it that's gonna help us reach those particular goals? So we are increasing, we're looking for our African-American students to increase ELA scores by 40% and almost double it in math. And, you know, and so again, we have math support, so we can talk about how that specifically is gonna help us reach that indicator. We're more than doubling the number of students in almost every category, well, not every, but around A through G requirements. I don't see anything in our LELCAP plan that's talking about how are we preparing all of our students to do, to reach the A through G requirements. The D and F rate, 47% of our African-American students, and I think it's 2020, 2021, have a D or F, and we wanna drop that down to 25%. How are we doing that? So, I mean, I, I feel like we need to have the conversation about, like you said, we have this laundry list of things. I'm just not seeing how those things are tying to these outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, so when we look at the, the laundry list of things that we want to like, what do we want to fund and what do we don't want to fund? I want, I want you guys as our educational experts to tell us these are the things that have the greatest impact that we think we have to do in order to reach these goals that we've identified in the LCAP. So I'm just having a disconnect around kind of how we set priorities and what the outcomes are that we want to achieve. Um, so I'm just gonna lay that out there and maybe as we kind of refine the next presentation, we can align more specifically how we really are, you know, what are the things that are going to directly impact these outcomes? And then with that goal that we've added around accountability, how are we going to really demonstrate that those programs had an impact on those outcomes? And I know that you can't always attribute success to one particular program, but what is the combination that we're doing that's having that particular impact? So I'm just going to lay that out there there because it, it, I'm finding my stomach is turning because I'm feeling like I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the strategy that's going to have the impact of this data that has remained fairly stagnant year after year after year. So, uh, and that's not to disparage all of the work, you know, Michelle and all the committees have done. It's just, you know, we keep spinning in the same dynamic of laundry list of programs without evaluating their impact. So I have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, Bridge, so I'm a little confused, assistant superintendent, oh, she's not there. Or are you, uh, well, if we can hear you. Um, with the ELO funds that we approved last night, Bridge, to my understanding, is also in the ELO funds that we approved. So is the 90,000 is on, is the 90,000 funding the expansion? And is the night, I thought when we were looking at the ESSER funds, and I don't know if the ESSER funds are included in all of the pages that you distribute, that you showed us. But I think with the ESSER funds that go out to 2023, if we are gonna fund Bridge, because Bridge has the data-driven outcomes that we wanna see, 
I think we have to be able to fund the cohort all the way through the four years. It can't be a one time, one year because those ninth graders are gonna come in and we're gonna to have to follow them all the way through. So I'm a little confused about the ELO funds, what the June funds are and the ESSER funds. And let me just ask my other two clarifying questions. Um, OFI, it doesn't look like it, ref and I'll just maybe echo what President Alper said, it doesn't look like our feedback from the last meeting was reflected where we said we wanted more boots on the ground. Um, and um, I just wanna clarify for the viewing public of 40 or so people that are out there. When we use the term unduplicated, staff is using the term unduplicated in LCAP. Our committees have started to transition to a term of prioritized students. I just want people to be clear we're talking about the same students um, and the terminology is, has been changing. Thank you. You know, I explained the ELO. Um, and also the, to, just to clarify the unduplicated too, because the, the state calls unduplicated the three groups, which are English learners, low income, and foster youth. We in our PAC and, and other committees want to include other students who are less advantaged and show to um, have a higher need in our district, which is to me is that that's yet my understanding of what the prioritize the the change of the vocabulary um elo i put one hundred and ten thousand dollars in elo based on my conversation with um jesse luxford and the bridge program to increase 1.0 fte which increases each of the teachers who run a cohort by 0.1 and then 0.2 for the coordinator um, so the, the, the idea in Pauline, in, in Director Fallensby helped me, or Assistant Superintendent, um, help me if I'm wrong about this. My understanding is the 90,000 is for the following two years, which uh, th I'm confused about that too, because my understanding would be that that should be 110, one FTE for those next two ongoing years. Um, I'm not, can you hear me now? No? A little bit. I don't know what went wrong. Um, I think I think this was to. Um, I think there may be some duplication there. I'm not absolutely sure. But when we looked at the proposal from um, from the bridge program, we thought the ninety thousand was just for one year for um, for expanding the cohort. So it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, I don't think we're looking at it for more than one year. I don't but, know if, but one cohort isn't one FTE, is it? No, if I can jump in, the, there's sort of been two proposals. The, the, the 1.0 FTE is um, essentially to um, be able to compensate each of the bridge teachers for an additional 0.1 FTE per year um, and to provide additional administrative support for the program. It doesn't expand the cohort size. Um, to expand to a second cohort per grade level, that was what Director Alper was mentioning, President Alper, um, and that's an additional 0.4 on top of the 1.0. Um, ultimately, if we were to double the size of the program, it's an additional 1.6 um, FTEs. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm still a little confused. So we have the 1.0 in the ELO, and then we have the 90,000 in the one-time only fun that I don't know where it's from. <laughs> so I, what, it, it, I, so what I, does the hundred, $200,000 get us? Does it get I, us an additional cohort or not? I think we, I think you've, we've crossed some wires. We clearly need to go back and just do some homework because we're, we are not clear on this, um, but we do have the two sort of fun, the, both the 110 and the 90 in those things. I've, I'd like a little opportunity to go back and do some homework on that one. Cause I think we just got some cross wires on our side. Okay. Do you, and, can I just add though, my understanding is that the 110 is for next year, the 90 is for the next year after that, and the 90 is for the next year after that to make it a three year expenditure. That's that, my understanding. That may, that may be, and I think we should do some homework to make sure we're all confident about that. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you have a response on, I mean, there's, we obviously can't do everything. We can't do, you know, um, there's, 
the, the money is what we have, but it is what it is. But I wonder if you, do you have any response on Director Sinai's question about OFI staff? Oh, about the, um, yeah, we definitely heard this, um, the, the feedback, we wanted to bring it back again this evening. Um, we're taking this in. By the time we get to um, next week's first reading, um, we're hoping to feel like we've got enough guidance at the board level to be able to put together this package um, and ultimately put this to a vote. That's where, that's where we'd like to go. Um, and I, I hope I'm responding to the right feedback and that is about the boots on the ground versus the additional administrative position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Director Vasudev. Yeah, I just wanted to um, echo what Director Sinai said, that I really want to make sure that we're making data-driven decisions, um, that we're looking at college and career readiness, especially for our African-American learners and Latinx students. And we know um, that that's, that's a great need, especially when we look at both Latinx and English language learners, and also our, our African-American students. My uh, main comment around OFI, though, is that I don't want to lose the and this, uh, you know, the comments that came from the DLAC committee in particular, and we heard them tonight, and also from community members about the need for Spanish-speaking staff at a district-wide level. And so, if we're looking at consolidating OFI positions, which I think is what President Alper had mentioned, right? Like instead of the supervisor position, um, you know, looking at more boots on the ground and if there's any consolidation of positions that either we think of, you know, making Spanish language a requirement or, you know, bilingual, bilingual um, services, some part of that job description. Because I think if we're creating more boots on the ground, that's important, but someone does, like right now, it's luck of the draw. If you have OFI staff that speak Spanish at, at your school site, that's great. Um, but if you're a Spanish monolingual family, right, and th that percentage of Latino families is only increasing in our district, you're out of luck. And so I want to make sure that that we're accommodating for you know how we're serving our Latinx families and our Spanish speaking families district wide with with OFI. So if there's any consolidation of positions, I would really look carefully at the job description for um, additional boots on the ground. Thank you for that. Um, go back to Director Babbitt. Oh, actually, sorry. Let me let me make a motion to extend the meeting. Um, I'm gonna make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.30. We still have the Latinx resolution to get to. Um, so I'm gonna say till 11.30. Fair second. I'll second. Okay. Um, Ms. Chires, are you with us? Yeah, uh, Director Miller. Yes. I'll, I'll do it. Director Vasudev. Yes. Director um, Sinai. Yes. Director Babbitt. Yes. Director, uh, Vice President Brown. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Um, go ahead, Director Babbitt. Um, yeah. So um, just Director Vasudev, just so you, um, you know, I've been looking at the data and it, it was shown in our LCAP plan that we really have 6.2% English language learner population in BUSD, which includes more than um, Spanish speaking families. And um, if you actually look at our Latinx families, most of them are um, third and fourth generation speaking English fluently. So we should be careful about not excluding um, our multilingual families uh, just to English or just to Spanish. And also in the, um, in the overall overview of this um, plan, right? if there are things that now we may want to cut, right? Like we have $70,000 that we've spent on um, uh, the middle school assignment consultant and the Washington renaming. Well, maybe that's a priority that a family engagement officer probably could lead just the engagement collecting of the, of the, of the data or someone else in the community could, could do that work, right? Because we're in a, a spot now that we need to make some bigger trade-offs and that may actually give us the uh, position for more parent empowerment workshops that you know we can outsource at a cheaper cost than a full-time staff as well to meet um, the concerns of the spanish-speaking families uh, you know around parent empowerment workshops in in spanish so how can we go through this now um, since we don't have the ban since we don't have what the subcommittees would have normally done uh, so that we can make uh, different priority trade-offs. I'm looking at a lot of stuff in here that I would do differently if I'm not gonna be able to adequately fund 
um, the framework and the special education, HR and the escape and the, you know, bridge. Um, we got a lot of overhead in here that we could probably do differently if we had the time to think differently. So I guess my question is to, uh, to President Alper as well as the superintendent, like we don't have the, you know, we don't have the SBAC recommendations. We're not meeting what the PAC has asked for. We're not hitting all of the marks. So we need to take time to do more trade-offs. Now, how do we do that? Can we give that information to Friday notes or what? Yeah, but Director Babbitt, I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a fair question. Um, um, and I mean, I guess to me, not being able to do everything that, that, um, that everybody wants isn't necessarily the concern, but the concern, or my concern, but, but my concern, I do, it is hard to do this without, for the, particularly the Superintendent's Budget Advisory Committee recommendations, Dr. Stevens, is there, um, is, and I know you haven't gotten it yet, I know this has all been a, a real time compress compression situation, but are we gonna, are you, is what you're gathering their recommendations for what these bans would be so that th we have, because it really, I don't think tonight we're really gonna be able to recommend bans in the way that you've asked. It doesn't, it just doesn't seem possible. And, but, it, mm -hmm. but it would be a lot easier to do if we had, I think what Director Babbitt is asking for, which is the recommendations of the committees that have already looked at these things. Is, does that make sense? And, and yeah, so, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, so is it, does it mean bringing that to us on June 9th and then, and we've done this in the past too, we've had to add a meeting in June for the budget because this is not, it's not unusual to be scrambling, you know, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, we could add a meeting on June 16th um, or, or, you know, through Friday notes, although that's not really a great way of doing it because we, we don't have a public discussion about it. So what are, you, what is, what are your thoughts about that? Because it's, yeah, um, I, I completely understand your point. It's a very reasonable one. Um, we're, we're planning to circle back to the SBAC members um, to both sort of engage to see um, if they need additional information to be able to help us make exactly these recommendations. Um, we'll plan to circle back to them tomorrow. Um, our last SBAC meeting was just yesterday, so that the timing has been pretty tight. Um, if it helps in our deliberations to add another board meeting, um, so that we have the opportunity to go back and revisit past decisions. That's that's also that's also within our ability to do. Well, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting uh, that we revisit past board decisions. But there's a lot of the forward, yep. you know, there's a lot of the forward-looking decisions that we still have to make. Well, I am because we always made those decisions under the caveat that we could change it at the end of the day. We've known since the beginning of the year that we have not seen this entire budget, right? So now that I'm looking at all of these numbers in its entirety, that's a different scope. And like um, uh, Director Sai and I said, our goal is to be student first. Our goal is to get student outcomes. We're not going to get student outcomes putting everything in overhead and not really making sure that we tie the actions to the accountability structure that we've all agreed we wanted to implement. This is a local control accountability plan, yet we don't know how these expenditures are going to match the accountability that we want to drive home. Our, our families have been struggling this year and they have said to us repeatedly, we need more direct services to our children. We are not providing that. These recommendations do not really provide that. And we need to really get on board with being responsive to the people that have elected us. And I know for a fact, we need to, if you have not signed the dotted line on that tentative agreement, 3.5% in one-time bonuses is not gonna help us get a BARA or a BSEP measure passed again. Not after this last year we had. Our parents and our communities want their students to their learning loss to be made up for. And this is not gonna get us there. I appreciate you all um, hearing my passion and, 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 and really understanding my concern. Absolutely, Dr. Babbitt. Um, Director Vasudev. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the comment that Director Babbitt said, um, and also some guidance that uh, Director Sinai pointed out, which is we have to be data driven, right? 
And even if it's only 6% of our students that are English language learners, which Dr. Stevens, you can confirm that percentage. The fact is that most of them speak Spanish, right? The fact is that DLAC has said on numerous occasions, because I'm the board member who's a liaison to, to DLAC, that they want Spanish language OP support. The fact is that many of our Latino parents have come before this district asking for the more- The fact Spanish. is we have four already that speak it's Spanish not on the director of Dev. Like it's literally it. you can meet a Spanish empowerment workshop without having a full-time Spanish speaking okay. family engagement liaison, a fifth one, by the way. Can I finish my comment? Yeah, go, go ahead, Director of Acidev. And if it's gonna be something new. Well, Direct about okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. Right. You can anyway, but I'm pretty sure we know what you're going to say. <laughs> well, okay. no, but, but I want to finish my statement. I'd like to finish my statement. All right, go ahead, Director Rossiter. Um, that you know, I can't ignore the comments from our DLAC committee. I can't ignore the comments from our from the communities that that we all represent. Right, 22% of those students are our students. They're all of our students. They're not my students. They're all of our students. Right. And so when parents are telling us, right, because the Latino population has been so impacted by COVID-19, hey, we need more Spanish language support at a district-wide level, I think we owe it to them to respond as a district. Thanks. Okay, let me, um, is there any other, Director, um, Vice President um, Brown, do you have any comments? Um, I don't think that the Superintendent Stevens um, gave us a clear understanding on when we would be able to come back um, to address this after you received the SBAC comments. So maybe some direction on how to move forward, taking into consideration how the importance of these comments, also taking into consideration the need um, to ensure that um, our budget items match our, um, our outcomes for our students that we would like to see. Um, as well as our priorities. So for Superintendent Stevens, if you could respond, take a second to respond to that, that'll help to move this conversation forward. Uh, sure, I mean, I'm only thinking off the, the uh, sort of on my feet right now. Um, in terms of finding more time for this discussion, um, please know that, that we, are, we are very open to that. So if we need additional meetings in June, we can do that. Um, and that would give us more time to consider the, the feedback of the SBAC group um, as it makes its own deliberations about this complicated budget. Um, so um, what I would welcome is the opportunity to work with board leadership to sort of figure out what this process could look like over the course of June so that we've got more time in public for these discussions. That's what I was gonna suggest that Vice President Brown um, and I um, work with you, Dr. Stevens, to try to figure out a, a, a schedule that incorporates this feedback and gets us to the a place that we feel comfortable with. Does yeah. that, Vice President Brown, does that, okay. Um, I'm going to, Director Sinai. So um, what we've done in the past, which was helpful is we had the SBAC recommendations, we had the PAC recommendations, and we had the um, DLAC recommendations, and we had the superintendents slash cabinets recommendations. Um, and I think that gets to the fact that we, we collectively uh, want to meet the needs of our students and we have hard decisions we need to make. And I think we don't want to pit our students against each other or our staff or our colleagues against each other that um, we have a targeted group of African American, Latinx, English language learners, special ed that we have to serve. Um, and I just want us to keep that all in mind and again, drive toward where our priorities are impacting those populations. Um, it's hard for me when I look at the debt today of all the different pages of the various budgets, um, Assistant Superintendent Polonsby, uh, and if we could have um, I think in previous decks, you've shown a grid of the funding stream and what cuts across the funding streams and what gaps are. That like this bridge question or um, some of the other programs that we know are in various budgets, because um, it's too hard to go back and forth and try to figure out what's in what. Mm -hmm. So that also, again, a tool to help us be um, to provide better uh, direction and advice. Um, it, we need a little bit more of a, a, 
a streamlined picture. And I know that's really hard because there are so many different funding streams that the, the spreadsheet gets really long. Um, but um, I, I think that's what we need in order to be able to, to see what are the blocks of funding that we want to be able to impact. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, Dr. Stevens and, and Assistant Superintendent Fowles? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I can picture it as well, and we can we can work together to try and put something like that together. Okay, um, Vice President Brown, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna echo what Director Sinai said. In the future, um, if this information or all of the information that we need possibly be given to us before we reach the floor of the board meeting, um, that would be as helpful as possible to ensure that this process is meaningful um, and also uh, in addition to it being meaningful, it runs smoothly. Um, Director Babbitt. Sorry, I just didn't lower my hand earlier. Um, I think you guys heard enough from me today, I'm good. Um, okay, uh, I, so, we'll, so we'll take this back. Um, Vice President Brown and I will talk with Dr. Stevens um, and let's move on to our action item, um, which, um, which is the um, Latinx res resolution that um, Director Vasudev has, has, has led in um, conjunction with Vice President Brown and, and of course, Dr. Stevens. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stevens, who I think is then going to turn it over to Dr. Vasudev. Yes, and my comments are going to be uh, pretty brief given the hour. Um, I just want to ex express, um, sort of on behalf of the staff, just our pleasure about this this uh, resolution. Um, it is very timely. It is very necessary. I think it sort of feels like the the call to arms that we all um, both want to participate in and that we recognize is really necessary. Um, we also recognize that it feels like a strong companion to last summer's Black Lives Matter resolution. Um, there are a number of elements in the resolution that we really wholeheartedly endorse as staff, including um, the use of data, the development of a dashboard, um, uh, calling out particular sort of cultural um, commemoration periods and looking at our curriculum, uh, as well as the identification and support of uh, affinity-based programs for Latinx students. I'm not mentioning all of the items of the resolution, but there's really a lot here. Uh, it feels very rich and we're all very excited to take part in it. So appreciate the board's endorsement of this anticipated endorsement this evening and then also the leadership of many people including Director Vasudev and Vice President Khadija Brown um, for their work on this. So, so uh, again, thank you and we're really happy to be a part of it. And thank you, Superintendent Stevens. I think, you know, it's pretty late but you covered a lot of, a lot of the basics. I also wanted to give just a big thank you to the staff, to the Teachers of Color Network for their feedback, um, for Latinos Unidos of Berkeley, um, for all the different folks that came together to draft this and especially to Dr. Tom, Tom Reinhardt, who I know went back, checked the data, provide, you know, provided numerous slide decks for this resolution. This resolution is, you know, not um, very new in the Bay Area, San Francisco passed one and, you know, pretty comprehensive resolution too for Latinx students and has been, you know, trying to implement it. It's also fairly new in San Francisco, but I know that um, it's really, it's really important that we make sure that all of the different strategies that you described today, Dr. Stevens, and, you know, as part of our investments in the budget next year, live within some kind of framework, right, that we're not that we're not just operating, as you say in Spanish, it's, you know, a la brava, that you're not just putting this together loosely, that it lives um, within a framework. And for me, I don't know if a lot of the public knows, but my board mentor is Vice President Brown. And when I first started on the board, I said, hey, Vice President Brown, I have this idea. I saw it on the other side of the bay. I think it'll be a great framework. And uh, I just wanted to give her um, just a big thank you for guiding me through this and for hearing me out and for helping me create a framework, right? Um, modeled off after her work. Um, also on the Black Lives Matter resolution. So thank you for, for your allyship and your support of Vice President Brown on this too. And I wanted to say that this year has been particularly hard for our Latinx students and their families. And in addition to serving on the Berkeley School Board, I also serve on the California Latino School Board Association. And one of the things that we've been watching is really closely is college and career readiness for Latino students, 
right? Latino students make up 50% of the public schools, over 50% of the public school students in the, in the state of California. Um, for those of you that don't know, the California Latino School Board Association is the largest affinity group school board association in California of school board leaders. We, um, you know, we're looking really closely at the fact that there's been a sharp decline in the amount of Latino students enrolled at an undergraduate level right now. And so we're looking at both for Latinx and English language learners, you know, what are the kind of interventions that we need? Why has the pandemic impacted them so much? A lot of them, you know, families are frontline front staff, you know, fr frontline workers. Um, so there's lots of reasons why this is happening, right? But we see that the opportunity gap is getting bigger within the Latino population. I know that a lot of my colleagues on CLSBA are working really hard to address some of their, their own opportunity gaps within their own districts. Um, but this framework is necessary. And I really hope that we get to a point where we don't need as a district these kind of frameworks, right? I really hope we close the opportunity gaps for our African-American learners, for our Latino students, for our students with disabilities, but we're not there yet, right? And so this resolution is articulating our commitment to doing it for Latino students. Um, but when Latino students succeed, all our districts succeed, right? When our African-American learners are succeeding, we all succeed. And so it's really important that we keep in mind that this is part of our, our commitment to equity. It's part of our work to be an anti-racist district. And in addition to you know, really being focused on the successful educational outcomes of Latino students, the resolution also includes cultural affirming programming, a you know, call out to things like Latinx Heritage Month. We don't have a separate resolution for Latinx Heritage Month. I think something that we've talked about or that, you know, as part of this pandemic, and I've been really glad to do this in coalition too with our AAPI community, is really trying to uplift you know, monthly affinity group celebrations. And so doing that in the upcoming school year for Latinx students district-wide, I think is also important. Um, so thank you, Superintendent Stevens, to the staff, to all the community members that took part in this. And uh, thank you for my, to my board colleagues for considering it today. Thank you so much, Director Vasudev. Um, Director, um, Director Sana. So I just, I just wanna do a big shout out to Director Vasudev and uh, Vice President Brown for, and Dr. Stevens, but really my board colleagues um, for championing this work. I think it's uh, really critical and, and Director Vasudev, I think your participation in um, raising and elevating, just like we talked about, you know, student director Miller earlier about really making sure the voice of students is at the table you've been very proactive in making sure the voice of our Latinx community and our native Spanish speaking community. I think um, having this resolution is reaffirming for the district overall. And it also demonstrates the heavy lift and the work we still have yet to do. And so I appreciate um, you guys bringing this forward. And I think the, the you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding, is that the right one? Where, you know, just like with the Black Lives Matter is we don't want just a resolution to pass. We need to look at how it is we're gonna implement. So um, I appreciate um, all the work you guys did. Thank you. And look forward to voting for it. Thank you, Director Sonic. Um, Director Babbitt and then Vice President Brown. I also just wanted to echo my support and appreciation and looking forward to um, voting yes for this resolution. And most important, looking forward to implementing all of the actions and services that we hope to achieve for our families of Latin descent. And um, also wanna say thank you, um, Dr. Vasudev specifically for, um, for holding this dear to your, um, from your campaign on to actually being on the board for actually moving all that you've moved forward. I do celebrate you and um, I know I just cut you off, <laughs> but I do apologize and do um, appreciate the work and the voice that you bring to this board. Thank you for that, Director Babbitt. Um, Vice President Brown. Um, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record up here, but um, Director Vasudev, this is a brilliant resolution. Um, you're giving, like President Alper said, you're giving me far too much um, credit because you were absolutely the brainchild on this. Um, but the, I appreciate this resolution so much. I appreciate the way it calls out um, our, our data right, with real numbers, specifically around um, student performance and our assessments 
And it also calls out our college and career readiness for our students, which is a conversation that's missing too often, or which is a part of the conversation that is, that is oftentimes missing. So thank you for your thoughtfulness um, in this. And um, to echo um, former school board director, uh, Leva Cutler's point and your point, uh, one thing that I super, super appreciate um, is the, um, although be it further resolved at the end, that says that this resolution um, is focused on the Latinx community, but it um, uplifts, it holds, uh, uplifts and unites the values of BUSD and how um, that the achievement um, from this resolution can also span across all other um, affinity groups. So thank you for your thoughtfulness um, in including that uh, and for your work on this and for being a champion for the work that you set out to do before joining the board and, and actually, are, 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 I'm getting tongue and tied, um, but the work that you set out to do on the campaign, you're actually doing um, here on the board and on the dais. So thank you for your leadership. Um, Director Miller, and, and some of your last ever comments as a board member. You almost forgot me. I'm not going to. Okay. No, I didn't forget you. I was okay. giving you um, the almost last word. I don't word. know how I'm going to follow what Vice President Brown just said. It's everything I want to say. I mean, I remember when we first met right after you got elected, this is the first thing you brought up to me about wanting to do and implement. So I'm just really proud and I'm really happy to go out and work with you and see you develop and grow to this moment. And um, it's just really like, and not saying it's a full circle moment yet because you still got a lot of time left in your term and you know how you're staying on here for a long time and getting stuff done but um it's really like an amazing benchmark and as someone who's like heard you talk about this right after you got elected like i'm just really happy and happy for you so can't wait to vote yes um and i'll just um i'll just add that um yeah well as director babbitt said this you just said this director miller I mean, you've been talking about this since before you got on the board. Um, and, you know, obviously we're happy for you that, it, that, it, that, you, that you, able, you put it together and that we're voting on it, but we're really, but it really is just, and again, you said this, I think Director Sign, I like the Black Lives Matter resolution, um, not just something that's gonna sit on a shelf. Like I, I, I wanna appreciate our staff for, you know, we passed the Black Lives Matter resolution and then, and then we we have been holding ourselves accountable to implementing it and looking back at it. We had a report back, I think six months or so later, where we said, okay, these are the things we said we were gonna do, have we done them? Um, which I really appreciated Dr. Stevens. And um, and I know that we're gonna do that with this one too. My, I, I think I said to you, Director Vasudev, when you brought this up before you were on the board and I, I said, well, I'm a little skeptical and I still am frankly, skeptical of resolutions and governing by resolutions, um, uh, that are meant to be more than just sort of ceremonial. Um, and um, but if we if we if we do them and we and they really express the will of the board and they have you know specific provisions that we can hold ourselves accountable to meeting, then they then they then they can work and they can and they can be something that unites us that speaks uh, as a board to the community um, and that does hold us accountable um, to serving our students. And um, so I, so. I, You've you've sort of converted me at least with respect to this resolution and the other ones that you've championed and um, and I also really appreciate what Vice President Brown pointed out um, about the language uplifting the unity and values of the district and supporting all of our students of colors and all uh, of color and all of our students um, from different backgrounds and abilities. Um, so I, and I know too from sort of being behind the scenes how much work went into this. It's only a four page resolution, but. It was the work. It was, it was a lot of hours of work, and not just you. I'm, and you, you are the first to say it. It's not just you. It's a lot of stakeholders in the community who contributed to this, who made edits on it, um, um, and and so it's the product of a lot of work, and will be the the, um, the start of a lot of work to serve our, our students better going forward. So I want to join in the congratulations to you for getting this to this point, and congratulations to all of us for approving it, which I hope we will do. Um, Vice President Brown, do you want to have the last word or we can give Director Rossi to have the last word after you, but go ahead, Vice President Brown. Um, just to, to add to your point, Director Rossi, um, that we hope that we are at a point in the district where we don't want to continue to do resolution stacking because we want to see um, improved results. And so I just wanted to ask you, Director Rossi, um, if there was a point in the resolution that you wanted to add 
or if you wanted to take the opportunity now to address um, accountability um, and, and what your plan is, your ongoing plan is around accountability um, and how we can ensure that the things mentioned and outlined in this resolution actually um, happen and take place and have the, the ability to review it as it is taken. Yes, for sure. So this is something, thank you so much, um, Vice President Brown for touching on that. And I know I'm just kind of learning from your experience um, that it's so important that we think you know, proactively about staffing and programs and really just strong evaluation for our work. And so one of the things that we were really intentional about calling out in the resolution is we want an annual report back to the board. Like, how are we doing on our metrics? And um, we want to report back that it's both in English and in Spanish that involves community-based organizations, right? I think one of the things that I'm really proud of our district this year is that we've started these affinity group meetings with the superintendent. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, Brent, I just want to tell Superintendent Stevens that I am so thankful for you just in the middle of this crazy pandemic, just to being open to meeting with affinity group representatives pretty regularly, um, because there's been a lot of hurt this year. And I think the pandemic has really exacerbated some of the issues that we know have existed in communities of color for a long time. And so I think, um, you know, the accountability will come from reporting back to the community. The accountability is going to come from, you know, really building out some of the programs that we've said we were going to fund. I don't name them in the resolution, but we know that, you know, as a board, we've committed to funding a Puente program. What makes Puente a really valuable program is its strong evaluation component. And the fact that it puts together a mix of cohorts of Latino kids. So it's English language learners, it's, you know, students that are having, that are struggling, students that are average students that are performing really well. And it's, um, you know, it's a whole group of students and together it's building them up for success. Um, but it also helps, you know, I think the other thing that we're thinking about doing, right, is really, and we haven't approved the final budget, but we're looking at a robust, you know, English language learner master plan. And that's so important because we have so many students that yet need to be reclassified. And so in the language of the resolution, some of the contributions from the Teachers of Color Network were around our commitment towards reclassification in particular. And so we didn't put a number there, but we said, you know, we want to see improved rates. We want ongoing progress monitoring and goal setting. And so it's in there, but as always, you know, Vice President Brown, and you know this so well because of your work, the proof is always in the pudding. And so <laughs> we'll come back next year. You know, we're, I'm gonna look at that report back and it will be data-driven to much, much of the comments that Director Sinai also said about the LCAP, right? Like, how are we being data-driven? And so a lot of that is kind of in there. I wanna make sure that that report out is data-driven, that Brea is really, that our Brea office is very involved that we are you know, moving the needle on reclassification for long-term English learners, and that these programs that we're, you know, we're, we're thinking of funding in our district, you know, really looking at them and saying like, hey, are they meeting the goals that they said that they, that they are meeting and which students are succeeding in and how are we building them out, right? I think you know, in the long-term, I would love for these resolutions to live under a more comprehensive equity framework like the 2020 vision that took many years and you know, I will say strong coalition building, like that's so important for our work as a district, just to have a more comprehensive approach towards equity. And so I think that's where I want to go next year. And I, and I know Vice President Brown that you and I are going to partner really closely on that. Um, but, you know, to make sure that we're, we're pushing ourselves to really hold ourselves accountable for closing the opportunity gaps for our most vulnerable students. And now we have a Black Lives Matter resolution, a lot in X resolution, hopefully, you know, after the vote. But you know we're still missing something for our special ed students, right? Which was the, the third group that was called out in our 2020 vision. And so have not forgotten them. It's on my to-do list. And that comprehensive framework um, you know, needs to come and it needs to come soon because a lot of our most vulnerable students will continue to suffer because of the long-term impacts of the pandemic. And so you know, we have a lot of work to do before us, but hopefully we'll get to a point where we won't need these resolutions. Thank you, Dr. Vesadev. Do you wanna make the motion? Uh, I motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Director Brown, uh, Vice President Brown. Um, Ms. Chires, are you still with us? Uh, Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Basabe? Yes. Director Babbitt? Yes. Director Sinai? Yes. Vice President Brown? Yes. President Alpha? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, we have um, our last thing is a, um, extended public comment. If you want to give a public comment, please. Whoa, okay. Um, 
Okay, please raise your hand now. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I'm cutting it off as of right now. Um, one minute each, because um, we have to stop the meeting at 11.30. Olivia Lim will be our last speaker. Um, the first speaker, so one minute, Vice President Brown. Um, please keep your comments to one minute. Um, I'm gonna cut you off right at one minute because we can't go past 11.30. Alana Lee, you're first, followed by Lindsay Nofelt, and then Denise Daflon. Hi, I'm Alana and I'm a sophomore at Berkeley High. I'm here to express why I do not believe we should switch to the block schedule. I, and I agree with absolutely every point made by Miles Miller. Personally, this year's schedule was very difficult. I had extremely unbalanced terms with three relatively easy classes in one term and my three hardest classes in the other term. I will be taking three AP classes next year and I cannot even imagine how hard um, three of those classes would be in the same term, all of which are being taught at an even more accelerated pace compared to having the regular six classes at once. Whether this is going to be a semester semester block schedule or any other type of block schedule, I still believe the regular six class schedule is the best option because students get passing periods after about an hour of learning. Sitting in a classroom for 100 minutes at a time is exhausting and students will lose, lose focus and interest. In regards to flex, I would really like to be assured that I'm not losing too many minutes of learning time. Flex is designed to relieve stress. However, I feel that the idea of lo losing learning time is stressful in itself. Again, learning at a normal pace consistently is more effective than cramming everything into a few months. We have gone through so many schedule changes in these past two years, and I feel that a sense of consistency in scheduling would be most beneficial for students. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. Um, um, Mati Tablum, followed by Lindsay Nofeld. <clears throat> Hello. Um, first step. I think uh, I find it uh, embarrassing that uh, uh, a high school student is being kept to one minute and cut off after uh, sitting through uh, four hours, four and a half of this meeting. Uh, she should be allowed to speak, as should uh, all other members of the community. And the fact that you cut off the meeting at 1130 uh, is not a good excuse to, uh, to um, basically silence the community. Second, I want to uh, uh, again commend uh, Director Babbitt for remembering who she represents and who is the constituency of this school board, students and their families, student and their families. So you seem to be forgetting this constantly. Uh, third, as I said before, this board should go back to in-person meetings, lead by example. You're saying that you're gonna come back to full time. Thank it's you. time for this board to go back to in-person meetings. Thank you. Um, Lindsay Nofeld and then Denise Daflon. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I wanted to thank D Director Sinai for asking for data-driven accountability in choosing what programs to fund for the LCAP. And I also want to address the elephant in the room that Director Babbitt also asked about. Why are we funding over $5 million in staff bonuses with COVID funds? We approved BARA, it's $10 million. We care about our teachers. We agree that they have to be fairly compensated, but Assistant Superintendent Bonsby said in this meeting, COVID funds must be used due to COVID because of COVID. So how do you equate these two rules? There are plenty of ways to use one-time funds in an evidence-based manner without funding new positions. Teachers could get math training or Wilson training, any teacher who wants it. You could expand capacity with district-led and outside tutoring services. Over and over, we've asked you to keep this student-centered. I hope that you come together again and keep your promise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Denise Daflon, followed by Martha Acevedo. Daflon. Good evening. Uh, do you hear me? Yep. Um, 
uh, tonight I want to acknowledge the hard and thoughtful work that was put into the proposed new TWI enrollment policy by BUSD staff from the district and the TWI school site. Also, the agenda and Zoom link to follow the policy subcommittee meetings were published on the district website. It allowed the community to understand the work that was behind the scene and to provide public comments. Thank you for your transparency and community engagement. The new policy provides adequate language for a more effective and transparent TWI admission process that will meet the enrollment needs of the TWI program. It centers enrollment around understanding the students' languages in a real, more realistic way. It affirms the TWI as a program for Spanish-speaking English learners. Thank you for moving for making this happen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ms. Stefan. Um, Martha Acevedo. And then Olivia Lim will be our last speaker. I think you're muted. Ms. Acevedo? Am I okay? There you are. Now we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. That's right. I particularly want to, I particularly want to commend uh, the, the board for their support of the achievement and success of all Latino, Latinx, Latinx students in Berkeley Unified School District. I, I had more things to say, but I'm gonna say particularly partnering through district structures and offices for culturally affirming activities and parent and engagement in multi-languages multi and English of all BUSD school uh, families. I also want to say that the Berkeley way is that no one stays behind. And at one point, one particular student, at another point, another kind of student is, is in need. And I think that the board has seen that and I really want to commend you. Uh, one last comment. As a former board member who has had to stay up late at night, I'd like to suggest that maybe you could put the budget stuff first so that we're still awake when we, when we hear it. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you so much. And it's great to have two former board members with us on one night. Thank you. Thank you. Former Director Acevedo. Um, Olivia Lim, um, you have the last comment. Go ahead, Ms. Lim. Ms. Lim, are you there? Are you there, Ms. Lim? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, now we can. Okay, great. Um, okay, I, uh, I'm a TWI parent and um, I understand many are very excited to go back to school in the fall, um, but I just uh, wanna urge you to please not forget about the students and families who, for whatever reason, may need to stay in distance learning. If there is going to be a movement towards independent studies, if you could please um, facilitate and you know, really think about how it will work for TWI students and not as an afterthought, but to really put some thought into how that would work. Um, I apologize, I missed some of this meeting, but I did tune in right when you talked about the possible requirement to uh, have um, elementary students unenroll from their current school if they have to go to independent studies. And I think you may be really doing a disservice to a slice of the population who are just waiting for the vaccine to come out for that age group, a possible lag of maybe two or three months where they may need to stay home, but would really love to rejoin their school community. Um, so I really urge you to take that into consideration. And um, no surveys were sent out to TWI families as that we know of. So please cons consider their needs as you talk about the conclusions you make from your surveys. Thank you, Ms. Lim. Thank, um, Thank you. All right, um, that brought us to the end of the meeting. Director Miller, congratulations um, and on your last meeting. Um, thank you everyone for a long packed meeting. Um, and we'll see you soon. Good luck, Director Miller. Good luck. Good luck. Congratulations. Bye.